Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the uh, FATS uh, Year 8 Options Evening uh, for 2022. Uh, fantastic to see so many of you have joined us already. Uh, so thank you very much for that. Um, those of you who don't know um, me, my name is Mr Newman. Uh, um, I'm here as uh, Associate Assistant Principal in charge of Curriculum and Assessment. Um, so I sort of oversee the options process um, from a whole school level. We also obviously have Ms. Shadbolt um, with us, who'll be with us throughout the evening to um, kind of, uh, um, between us, we will be hosting uh, the event. Um, and obviously throughout the evening, we'll be welcoming our heads department and subject leads from the different subject areas as well. Um, you'll hopefully have seen the schedule uh, on the options website, which I also sent out um, um, to parents as well, outlining kind of uh, how we've grouped subjects together and we will work through and discuss the different subjects um, as we will go through the course of this evening. Um, if you should have any questions during the course of this evening, over and above the ones that you have already submitted on the Google form, um, then you should be able to submit those via um, the live feed on YouTube. Um, and we will come to those at appropriate times during the evening, um, whether they are subject specific or um, kind of more general questions. Um, we will um, uh, also be addressing all the questions that you submitted on that Google form as well. Um, so um, again, kind of li listen out for those as well. A few things I just kind of want to uh, start by uh, kind of talking about. Obviously, the, the main aim of this evening is to help students make really, really good, well-informed choices um, about their um, um, about their options. We appreciate that this uh, may be a situation where some students will already have a pretty good idea, whereas others may be less sure. And, and we really hope to be able to use the opportunity this evening to provide um, that advice uh, needed for uh, uh, for students and answer questions where we can. Please rest assured, however, that this evening is not the end of the process, um, quite the opposite, in fact. Um, over the next couple of weeks, um, as I'm sure you will have already seen, we've got our taster sessions running. A reminder that that timetable is also on the options website. Um, and if students are a little bit unsure about some of the options, we would encourage them to go along to those. And they've started uh, yesterday and today with uh, media and dance, I believe. Um, so uh, I hope students have really enjoyed those particular taste sessions and continue to do so. Uh, the deadline for then getting in uh, your options choices, again, via a Google form, which is on the options website, um, is the 22nd of March. And we will uh, obviously remind students between now and then. But hopefully that allows a couple of weeks for students to attend those taste sessions, to get advice if they need it, um, and, and make those really well-informed choices. Um, also, any time over the next couple of weeks, um, I'm obviously more than happy to speak to any students who, who want to come and see me uh, about their option choices. Um, Ms Shabolt is also obviously available for the same purpose. Um, and the students can also talk to their form tutors um, about uh, sort of any general questions or concerns they may have. Uh, questions about specific subjects, um, I would suggest are directed at the subject uh, specialists. Um, and again, if students aren't sure who those people are, hopefully this evening will help because obviously we will have the relevant representative, head of department or subject lead from each subject area. Um, but if still they're not sure, then please come and speak to me and I can always direct them to the correct place. Um, we are obviously going to go through a range of options this evening, um, and we're very uh, proud of the fact that at Farnham Heath End School, we offer a really, range, a really wide range of different options. Um, please be aware that all option uh, choices uh, will need to reach certain minimum numbers uh, in order to uh, run. Uh, obviously, we have a responsibility um, as a school to make sure that we are uh, uh, running things in the appropriate way. So it's really uh, uh, important that we emphasise that, but obviously we do want to make sure that all students are able to access the options that they choose. Um, we, we hopefully only have one apology this evening, that's from Miss Lua, um, who is um, representing food and nutrition. Unfortunately, she's unwell this evening, so will not be able to join us. 
Um, hopefully we will still be able to provide a little bit of information about uh, the food nutrition course when we get to that part of the evening. But she's also very happy to answer via email um, any questions that, that students may have. We're going to start then with uh, some of the general questions submitted on the Google form. Um, a lot of these parts of the evening, we're going to run a little bit like a Q&A between ourselves. <laughs> so uh, Ms. Shabal is going to ask me uh, some of those questions and then um, um, I will uh, provide the answers. Equally, as we get on to the heads of department and subject leads, uh, one of us will pose questions to them and then they will answer those as well. So, um, Ms. Shabal, if you'd like to fire away with the first yep. question, please. Um with the taster sessions, do we need to book these in advance? Okay, so great question there. Uh, taste sessions, you do not need to book in advance. Uh, the timetable is um, obviously there uh, for you to access and you can just turn up at that time uh, and I'm sure the member of staff will be very happy to see you there. And then um, will we know who will possibly be teaching our GCSE option classes? Because I like Teacher X. And I want to be taught by Teacher X. OK, this is a really common question that we get. And, and, and I would want to really emphasise that students should not be choosing options. I know it's really hard to do this, but should not be choosing options based on things like whether or not they like their current teacher, for example. Um, obviously, there's loads of factors that go into that. And timetabling a school of this size is really complex. So we would never be able to guarantee a certain member of staff, certain teachers, certain groupings, all of these sorts of things. So anything to do with teachers, I put into that same category, anything to do with, oh, I want to do it with my friend or with this group of people. Please, please, please do not make option choices based on those things. Make option choices on the subjects that are best for you, based on your strengths and weaknesses, based on your passions and based on your plans for the future. Um, and if you can do that, that's what's really going to set you up for success. And then um, does my pathway limit me regarding my triple science or not? OK, so we'll expand on this question more. We had quite a few questions about differences between separate science and combined. So we'll expand on this a bit more when Mrs. Birtwistle joins us shortly. But broadly speaking, it doesn't because the... Um, uh, decision around whether you do triple science or separate science so those terms are sometimes used interchangeably so i noticed a lot of the questions that came from the google form about this referred to triple science we in school tend to refer to it as separate sciences but they're the same thing um those uh, uh the decisions around whether you do that or combine science are made by the science department um and are not made at this stage so that is not something that has to be decided now. So you may well be uh, um, able to, uh, obviously, well, you will be able to choose your options now. Um, and then obviously that decision will come later in, in communication and, and in conjunction with um, your son or daughter's uh, science teachers that they have for GCSE. Yep. And then I really like history, geography and a language. Can I choose all three of those to do? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, and again, that that's a, it's something we would encourage uh, um, as many students as possible. We'd, we'd really encourage all students to uh, uh, consider doing uh, either history, geography and at least one language. Um, you, you should be aware already that you need to choose at least one out of history and geography and the languages. So everyone needs to choose at least one. We would actually uh, recommend that uh, um, um, most students where possible choose history or geography and one language you can absolutely then is one of your other options choose one of those other things so you could for example do history geography and french you could do history french and spanish you could do history geography and spanish these sorts of combinations are absolutely fine and and we would really encourage that and that's a really uh, a fantastic set of options in terms of academic rigor and challenge for the for the students as well. That's good. Um, I think that's our general questions at the moment. Um, is there a minimum number of students in a class? So the so the minimum number of students will vary from subject to subject, and there's various considerations that we have to put in place around that. 
uh, obviously some subjects have different requirements, especially around uh, um, practical subjects. There are health and safety considerations yeah. and all of these sorts of things that we have to take into account. So uh, when we talk about reaching minimum numbers for a subject to be viable, that will vary. And we do look at it very, very carefully. We will try and offer options wherever we can. My, you know, my, my priority is to be able to offer a broad and balanced curriculum as much as we possibly can. However, I, I also need to emphasize that that may, in some areas, mean we have to make a couple of compromises. Um, obviously, if that is the case, we will communicate with students and parents affected uh, to make sure that they are uh, uh, aware of that, they're aware of the reasons, and they're fully consulted about uh, what we do as an alternative. Okay, so in a moment, uh, we um, are going to move on to uh, discuss our core subjects. Now, obviously, our core subjects uh, for this evening, um, obviously, this is an options evening, and the core subjects actually aren't optional. Um, we are, uh, um, we think it's important, however, to discuss them and to provide some information on those, um, because obviously this forms a really important part of um, your education. Um, and um, we think it's useful for you to get a, a, an understanding of the whole picture of what will make up your, um, your education as a whole in your curriculum over the next important three years of your uh, time at Farnham Heath End School. Um, and there are always, uh, quite understandably, some questions around uh, certain things to do with uh, some of those subjects uh, and things like that. With the core subjects and with any of the subjects here this evening, um, remember there is plenty of information as well on the options website. So if you haven't yet had a chance to explore that, please do take those opportunities where you can um, to look at the videos and read the information on there because that also provides some really helpful uh, um, information for everyone as well. Um, and also just a reminder that although we are doing our question and answer between ourselves on things pre-submitted, um, please also feel free to submit questions through the live stream uh, via YouTube as well um, to, uh, um, uh, if, if you wish to uh, submit questions as we go. It'd be great to hear from you um, and we really want this to be as interactive um, as possible for everyone involved. Okay, so um, I could see uh, uh, Miss Savile and Mrs Burtwist who are eagerly awaiting in our waiting room, so I'm going to invite them in now. Um, for this bit, slightly confusingly, I'm now going to switch hats. Uh, I'm now head of English for the next 15 minutes. OK, so uh, some of you may know that's my other role in school. So I'm now head of English. Ms. Shabbat is going to lead this part of the evening and I'm going to welcome in uh, Ms. Savile and Ms. Bertwistle um, from Maths and Science. Evening, ladies. Evening. Mm -hmm. um, right, so I think we'll start with um, Maths and Science because English, you're not tiered anymore, are you? You are one tier for the whole, the cohort. Um, how do you, Don, uh, Ms. Bertwist will ask you first, how do you determine the tiers of entry for your students? Okay, so in year nine, can you hear me okay, Mrs. Shadbolt? Um, in year nine, we we don't tier the students, um, uh, we don't tier the students. We do have um, one top set and one mixed ability group, but they're not, we don't assign an award um, in year nine. Um, at the end of year 10 is when we make our final decisions about um, about awards. So it's not really about tiers, it's about which award they'll do. So they could be put into separate award or combine science award. And combined science can be either higher tier or it can be foundation tier. Okay. Um, Ms. Savile, maths, how do we determine their tier of entry? So it's, um, it's quite similar. In year nine, everyone is following um, a similar scheme of learning so that everyone has the opportunity to be exposed to all of the content. Um, and then as we get to the end of year nine and into year 10, we will start to assess a little bit more thoroughly and rigorously in line with the um, exam board spec. And that is when we'll start to identify which tier might be more appropriate. 
Um, however, the final decisions are not made till year 11. So we have um, the flexibility until then to kind of move between the tiers as and when the students develop their skills and we can see what's most appropriate for them. Yep. Um, Miss Birtwistle, back to you. Yeah. How is it decided who does separate science versus who does combined science? So in in by the time we get to year nine, the end of year nine, we have a good idea of which students will be in uh, doing separate award tier, but we we don't set anything in stone until the end of year 10. And we generally, very vaguely and very generally say that if students are able to achieve grade sixes and above, we have confidence that they will be able to cope with the, with the separate award concepts and manage that course. Um, but even then, we are we we do negotiate it's all up for negotiation and we can talk and discuss and meet with parents if there's a particular student who's desperately keen to do separate award um we still keep our doors open for those students um yeah perfect um mr newman are english literature and language taught separately Yes, yeah, so um, a move actually we, we, we took a couple of years ago was to completely separate the teaching of the two subjects. That's not to say there's not some crossover uh, between the two. Of course, some the skills do complement one another, uh, but we actually now timetable it separately. So uh, in the September of year nine, when you get your timetables or when your sons or daughters get their timetables, you will see that uh, there are some codes as English literature and some codes as English language. Um, we tend to uh, skew it slightly towards English literature in terms of time, so we, we give slightly more uh, uh, curriculum time to English literature, uh, <coughs> because the, the content is, is more. But they are taught completely separately. Uh, students will have two separate books, uh, which are helpfully different colours, uh, to help them distinguish as well what uh, the differences are between the two subjects. And that we found also really helps when it comes to revision time or when we say things like, you know, you've got an English language mock coming up, which I know is a way off for, for, for this year group. But obviously, it's all the building blocks towards that where they know then which which thing it is that we're talking about um, um, by doing that. So they are taught separately. Um, I'll also just mention very briefly about the, the tiers thing. Miss uh, Shabbat was absolutely right. We don't have tiers in English. The, the uh, spec is designed to cover the full range of grades from, from one to nine and the way that it's uh, um, assessed and the way that the papers and the mark schemes designed are specifically tailored to allow for that so students can access any grade uh, on that. Um, and all students follow the same curriculums, um, um, you know, at the sort of same uh, times of year and things like that. So, you know, every student kind of it's fully inclusive in that sense. And every student is given the uh, uh, the opportunity to achieve the best possible grade for them. Lovely. Um, Miss Savile, one last question for you. Um, my my child is exceptionally gifted in maths, flying. Is there any additional things that they can do at FHES with yourself and your department? Yeah, so we do offer further maths. So uh, further maths is something that we offer um, mainly when we get into year 10, we start to look at that, not so much in year nine, um, but that is a further qualification that the students can obtain. And um, that's optional um, for, for most students who are, we, we would encourage those who are capable um, of obtaining that, we would encourage them to do it, although it is open for discussion with all. Um, there's also the statistics GCSE, of course, which I'm sure you're going to hear a little bit more about later. Um, so the statistics is a separate option. Um, and especially if you're interested in maths, potential for economics or business studies or enterprise, um, the statistics fits in that quite nicely as well. Thank you very much. I believe that is our... No, it's not. We've got 10 more minutes. Need to be oh, able to read the time. Does anybody have any questions out there? We do have one, Mr Newman. I think that's actually, I think that we're ever talking about modern foreign languages. So I might say yeah. that for when Miss Sarazen joins us um, shortly as part of the EBAC group. Um, I do think kind of it might just be useful to kind of talk uh, a little bit, if we can, um, around the, uh, what, yeah, what, what, what do we all start with? Um, in year nine um, and, and how kind of do we build through the course kind of 
you know, uh, in terms of what students learn and in what order, I think would be quite useful. Yep. So students know what to expect in the autumn. Shall I start? Yeah. So in science, obviously, we follow the three specialisms. So all students will follow biology, chemistry and physics. Um, and year and in year nine, they all follow the same course. So like I said, we don't make any decisions in year nine on what award they will follow. So in biology, they will focus on cells and and um, um, or organization they call it but infection and disease and 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 um and cells that's where we start so we build on uh we we, we build from the very beginning and build our way up in chemistry it's, it's about the atomic structure and the periodic table and and um how mm. how elements bond um all the different ways that uh elements can, and chem and compounds can bond um and then that goes into more uh, that all of that helps helps connect all the other parts of chemistry um, in year 10 and in year 11. We're constantly revisiting the year nine work. Um, so, and then in, in physics, we've got, in physics, they start with energy and then we move on to electricity. So that, they're the main two topics in year. And again, they're fundamental topics um, that will help them guide them through the whole of the three year course. Um, so, and they all follow the same curriculum. Um, tailored for, for for all the students okay so in terms of maths um we are currently developing our scheme of learning so there will be some changes for these this current year eights into year nine it'd be slightly different compared to what this year's year nines are doing um because they are actually following a different scheme of learning for year eight as well uh, again they will all do the same the topics will be the same um, and we will start we've, we've done a lot of number work recently um some algebra and we will continue with that as those building blocks for the high level topics so they will um cover the full range so we'll have number, algebra, geometry, shape, space, and measure, probability and statistics. They'll cover elements of that throughout. And as we go through every next module, we'll build on previous learning. So again, year nine, very similar, is making sure the real basics are embedded at the first, um, first half term, ready to then build on that as we go through. Um, and yeah, in English, we um, start, obviously, as I said earlier, we start with uh, separating the two subjects. So in English uh, language, uh, we start to relay the foundations around non-fiction texts. So um, for English language, they, the, the uh, course is structured around uh, kind of in two categories, which later will become the two papers that they sit fiction and non-fiction. Um, so we start with uh, really familiarizing ourselves with uh, non-fiction texts. The scheme of learning is called the rhetoric, the rhetoric of protest, um, which, uh, as the name suggests, gives some really meaty topics for students to get their uh, teeth into, uh, consider their own opinions, as well as reading the uh, opinions of others um, as well. Um, I think, um, and I think that, you know, that's, that's really important to kind of get them to discussing different things and, and also forming their, their writing around those, those things. Um, in terms of literature, we actually uh, um, respond quite a lot to the needs of students. So we may slightly change our order depending on you know, uh, what, what students might need. Um, but we have uh, um, actually previously started with uh, texts in year nine that um, aren't, aren't uh, then later assessed in GCSE, but are um, studied in a GCSE way. Um, so we are teaching the uh, analysis skills and the level that is uh, necessary for uh, um, GCSE study before we then tackle in the January of year nine, we tend to start Romeo and Juliet, which is the student's Shakespeare text. Is there, are there any books that you would recommend them reading over the summer as an introduction to GCSE? So um, there aren't any specific books. I would say that you know students who do well in English um, are, um, or students who, who really excel in English, I should say, are frequently students who we who read really widely. So you know the more students can read, uh, the better. And obviously at the moment they have their accelerated reader lessons once a week, uh, and I'd encourage them to make the most of that. 
um, and make the most of any other opportunities that they have both in and out of school to read really widely. Um, we don't necessarily recommend that students read the texts before they study them because actually it's quite nice to go on that journey with us. Um, and also it's quite, uh, it can be really, um, uh, it, it can really sort of help their understanding if they you know, are doing that obviously in a classroom environment. Um, but, you know, for, for anyone who's interested in the, the GCC literature texts, Shakespeare is Romeo and Juliet, as I mentioned. 19th century text is A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. The, what they call the modern text um, is uh, An Inspector Calls by J.B. Priestley. Um, that's a play. And um, then they also do the power and conflict uh, poetry uh, uh, cluster from the anthology. And do they buy their own books? We do, yeah. So we do ask, and we will, we will always give notice, of course, when they're supposed to do that. We do ask students to buy their own copies of the text. They can annotate in lesson, um, <coughs> but um, we will always provide notice of that. And there is obviously support available for anyone who, who finds that difficult for any reason. They're very welcome to uh, make sure that we can uh, support them uh, as a school. OK, um, I've got a couple of questions come up. Um, one is for maths. Um, they understand how science can be split into three different subjects and with the three GCSEs and the tiering um, instead of two, but not how this applies to maths. Oh, I'm really sorry, my light's gone out. Um, so I can explain that. that. I can explain that while you go and sort your lights. Thank you. <laughs> So um, in terms of maths, the specification is actually shared on the options website. Um, and it is a case of there is some content that is higher only, there is some content that's foundation only, and there is some in what we call the crossover. So um, in year nine, the majority of the content that is covered will be foundation and the crossover. And then as we go into year 10 and 11, as I said, we, we look at tiering later around that time. And that is when some groups might look have uh, have a look at some of the particular higher topics and others will work on embedding and continuing with the foundation topics. So it's actually topic split that makes the difference between the higher and foundation. Um, the higher paper will allow students to achieve anything from grade nine down to a grade four. Uh, anything below that, unfortunately, they would ungrade on a paper. Um, the foundation allows them to achieve anything from a five down to a one. So um, that's a decision we make nearer the time in terms of where the students are performing um, and what we think is most appropriate for them. But the key thing is the students can gain a four or a five on higher or foundation. Um, and unless students are looking at pursuing maths or some sciences at a higher level, actually a four or a five is what most colleges are looking at at present that so they can get their pass on either paper lovely okay lovely um, thank you i think we're we're, we're gonna uh, um thank you very much uh there um uh, miss savile and mrs burt whistle we've got our eback subject uh hods waiting so uh, thank you very much for your time um everyone uh watching um I can see some some other sort of more general questions coming through in the chat, which we will address at points during the evening as well. So um, obviously, I'll be able to come back to some of those. I can see one directed at me as well, which we'll come back to at appropriate times as well. Okay, so um, we will now uh, start to move on to our. Um, we will now start to move on to our eback subjects. Um, just uh, before we do that, any uh, for anyone who's not aware, um, EBAC is just a, 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 an abbreviation of the term English Baccalaureate, uh, which is the uh, um, term used for the collection of subjects uh, that you now see represented here. So it's the basically core subjects plus history, geography uh, and uh, modern foreign languages. Together, that makes up something called the English Baccalaureate. Um, and where students do something from all of those subjects and therefore achieve the English Baccalaureate, that's quite highly regarded by uh, further and higher education providers. So we are now going to uh, welcome and um, Ms. Shabolt, uh, during this time, uh, um, feel free to go and, you know, put 50p in your meter, as someone's just suggested, because the light kept going off, um, oh, really? or uh, uh, grab yourself a, a drink, uh, and we'll yep. see you in a moment. But we're now okay. going to welcome uh, uh, Miss Sarazen, 
um, who's head of uh, modern foreign languages, uh, Mr. Bolton, head of history, and Ms. Rogers, head of geography. Good evening, everyone. Hi. Good evening. Good evening. Hi. Um, so we're um, going to start then um, with some uh, questions um, for you, please, Ms. Sarazen. Um, yeah. around, first of all, can students take more than one language? Yes, they can. Um, we're really, really keen to accommodate um, wherever possible um, students who are keen linguists. Um, the only thing that I will add to that is that for French and German, they must have studied the Key Stage 3 curriculum before taking GCSE or um, be strong linguists because they have a familial link um, or have some level of fluency if they haven't already studied it. Perfect, thank you. And obviously, if there are uh, um, those 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 family links or other reasons why, please do get in touch with with us um, and and make us um, aware of that. Um, so I think you've already kind of answered this, but can you just clarify so that it's really clear? Uh, can students study a language from scratch at GCSE? The only facility that we have for that at the moment, um, virtually, is the Spanish situation. OK, any students who are current students of French or German or who wish to study French or German from scratch, if they haven't studied it at school, will need to show and demonstrate that they have um, a considerable knowledge of it first before embarking on the GCSE course. Uh, our current capacity does not allow us to offer French and German from beginner level. It is designed to be taught after the two years of Key Stage 3. Lovely, thank you very much. Um, in terms of um, history then, please, uh, Mr. Bolton, could you just very quickly, someone's put in the live stream there, what, you know, what do we do for history? So if you just very quickly run through kind of some of your key topics or key time periods that you study in depth. Yeah, sure. So, yeah, so there's four units we cover all together. Uh, Germany, uh, which covers the uh, sort of First World War, Weimar period, up until uh, well, the Nazi, uh, until the end of the Nazis in 1945. We do the Cold War, but only from 1945 to 72. So obviously the Cold War is key if you're following the news at the minute, all the events going on in Ukraine. Uh, we do, uh, for the local study, we look at Elizabeth I, and uh, each year there's a different sort of uh, historical environment, uh, a uh, historical building we study. So uh, for example, Hampton Court, uh, somewhere, like, somewhere similar to that. Uh, and we do the history of medicine, so uh, lots of different time periods. So we look at how medicines change from the medieval period, the Renaissance, industrial period to today. So uh, lots of different periods of history, but I'd say overall more of a focus on modern history. Perfect. Thank you. Similar question to you then, Miss Rogers, around just a very briefly, what are some of the key topics in job? Can you just give us a flavour of some of the key things that <coughs> students would expect to study? Yeah, of course. There's uh, three units. One's on global geography. So you've got your um, hazards, you've got your tectonic hazards, your climatic hazards, development and how countries are able or what are some of the factors that stop them from developing. Um, and then you've got urbanisation. So looking at cities and how cities differ across the world, um, like the creation of slums. So that's one big unit. Your second one is all UK geographies, which look at um, rivers and coasts and geology, which is your physical geography. Uh, then you've got your human geography, which is similar to what you do in unit one in terms of your development and your cities, but specifically looking at the UK. And then you've got your fieldwork element in that unit too. Um, and then your final unit is... Um, it kind of puts all ties all those together. It gives you a resource booklet and it allows you to bring all your skills together, your knowledge of your biomes and allow you to make a geographical decision um, and come up with an opinion at the end based on everything you know. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, can Again, just as we go around um, again, we just think a little bit about uh, sort of styles of assessment. Um, in each of your subjects. So um, obviously for languages, and there's a speaking element, these sorts of things. So if you could just give us a bit of a, 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 an idea of that. And for, for history and geography, you know, the sort of balance of uh, uh, essay writing versus other types of question and those sorts of things as well. So Miss Alison, if I come back to you, first of all. 
Yeah, sure. So um, all the language courses are 100% terminal examination, okay, which means that uh, it's all assessment. There is no coursework element. 25% um, of the exam is listening, 25% is speaking, 25% is reading, and 25% is writing. Perfect. Thank you. Um, Mr. Bolton. Yeah, for history, there's likewise, there's, there's no coursework. Uh, there's two exams, uh, so two units on each exam, and there's a mixture of questions. I mean, each each uh, unit has one extended writing question, which is roughly around 16 marks. So that will the students will need to write an essay for those. Uh, but there are other questions, sort of four, six mark, where they you know, describe somewhere you have to explain an answer. Uh, talk about the consequences of something that's happened, why something is a turning point. Uh, and as each exam has a, at least one source question, so you will need to study a bit of historical evidence and uh, explain your interpretation of that evidence as well. So, uh, you know, a mixture of questions overall. Perfect. Thank you. Ms. Rogers? Yeah, ours is all exam as well. Uh, three exams for the each one has a unit. The longest question is eight marks and there's three eight markers in the first and second paper. Um, there's two in the third paper and a 12 marker, which is the one where you kind of bring your opinion and use the resource booklet. But year seven have been doing that, year seven and eight have been doing it since they started year eight markers. So they're nothing to worry about and they've practiced it a hundred times. So can't be scared of them. <laughs> Perfect, thank you. And just finally, um, obviously we're hoping that the sort of wider school life is starting to pick up in terms of trips and these sorts of things again now. So trips and extracurricular activities that support our curriculum. Um, are there any opportunities in the pipeline or potential things? Obviously we know that it's an uncertain time, so we're not gonna commit to anything, but just any flavors of things that students might have the opportunity to do just in our last minute or so before we move on to our next group of subjects. Um, we've worked with Surrey University in the past. They do an outreach program and they offer some um, additional uh, days where budding linguists can come and spend a day with them. Also, some of the colleges open that. So we're hope hoping that this will be up and running again in the future. Perfect. Thank you. Mr. Bolton, anything from you? Yeah, we're, we're uh, now that there's a bit more uh, we the options with COVID restrictions ending, uh, we're hoping to get the trip to Germany running again, which has happened previous years. So uh, that's hopefully in the pipeline. And something I've done in other schools, I, I used to enter schools uh, into the International History Bowl and B, which is a history uh, trivia co competition. I'm hoping to get year nine involved next year. And it's quite an exciting competition um, and the, the winning team goes to Las Vegas. So hopefully uh, uh, we'll see how we get on with that. Okay. If I can have a place in the Las Vegas. Yeah. Please. Um, okay. Uh, and Ms. Rogers from you finally. Yeah, we have field work for every student in geography and then there will be an optional trip to Iceland next Easter. Uh, hopefully details will go out about that soon, as soon as we're allowed. <laughs> um, and then hopefully the following summer there will be a fundraising, um, like a, a kind of environmental but also helping community trip to Kenya. Perfect. OK, um, listen, we're going to say thank you to um, our heads of our EVAC subjects for their time this evening. Um, so um, thank you very much to everyone. Um, you can now go and enjoy your evening. Um, <laughs> and we will in a moment welcome some of our creative heads of department. Um, so um, we will now, um, well, I'm now just going to address a few of the um, I'm now just going to address a few of the um, general questions that have come up in the meantime on the live stream. So uh, first of all, um, something about uh, mixed ability groups. There's actually a few questions that kind of link to that about uh, one about um, how um, we prevent boredom of higher achievers, but also another question about support available. Um, I think really here, obviously, you know, um, you know, our, our staff are, are really really well used to all the teachers at Farnham Heath End School are really well used to teaching mixed ability groups and groups with a wide range of students in them um, and um, all of the option subjects will be to some extent uh, taught in mixed ability so um, you know really that's you know uh, down to the uh, uh, teachers kind of 
uh, own professional skill and judgment and and obviously our teachers are are always more than happy to offer the support and indeed the stretch and challenge that may be required for individual students um and always especially if a student thinks they need a bit of extra support you know I, i'd always encourage them at any level not just a gcse to to go and speak to their teachers to 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 seek out that support and obviously we'll do our best to put those uh things into place um there is um kind of another question there a little bit around uh kind of specific support groups uh around um uh, the entry level qualification um, and things like that. Those are all part of the personalized pathway, which some of you may have seen information about on the uh, options website. The personalized pathway, obviously by its, its name suggests, is exactly that, is very personalized. Um, and for that reason, if we think that uh, that's something you would, uh, you or, or your, your son or daughter would, would uh, benefit from, um, we would, uh, um, we will have contacted you uh, about that, or or you will receive contact from us about that. If um, you don't get that contact, and you're, you, you know, you think that's something we should be kind of considering, please do get in touch with me, uh, and I'm more than happy to kind of support there um, where I can. Um, other questions uh, that we had, are you able to do both history and geography? Yes, you are. Um, so you, you uh, uh, can do, uh, you can select both history and geography. Um, and earlier someone had asked, can you select history, geography and a language? Yes, you can. Um, and that would be, you know, a fantastic set of options. Um, around the languages, um, Obviously, this year we're in the advantageous position that all of year eight have done Spanish uh, this year. Uh, so any student can choose Spanish um, uh, this year. Um, and as Miss uh, uh, Sarazen said there, any student can also choose uh, the other language that they've done. So currently all students are doing either Spanish and French or Spanish and German. So they have those options available to them. The only thing they cannot pick from a language's point of view, unless they have a family link or, or a specific reason for doing so, is the language uh, that they have not studied at all. Um, question uh, regarding English um, with the uh, literature uh, texts, do you have access to dysle uh, dyslexia friendly publications? Um, yes, um, we have we have had this request in the past. We have had students who greatly benefit from that. So we we obviously work with those students on a case by case basis. If there's uh, um, if there's the need for that, we're more than happy to to cater for those um, as and when that may be required. So um, uh, we do have uh, those available, and if uh, you need uh, us to, we can recommend certain versions. Um, of that as well. Um, question about film studies. Um, uh, film studies uh, letters uh, will be coming out by the end of this week. So students, uh, again, film studies is a is a quite a, a, a tailored, personalised course. Um, it being an AS level that students are studying early. So uh, those letters will be coming out this week for students. Uh, um, who we uh, think should consider taking that as a subject and Mrs Code um, will be here to speak about both media and film studies a little bit later this evening and a final question uh, uh, from the more general ones in the chat we've got uh, in terms of grading um, it, you know, if we don't understand numbers uh, please can we explain the uh, uh, number equivalents to letters so um, it goes one to nine with uh, a nine being the top. Uh, so some people around the time this changed referred to nine as the sort of a star star. Um, so that sits, it's the top 20% of students who would have got an A star. An eight is then equivalent uh, approximately to an A star. Seven A, B uh, um, um, is equivalent to a six. Um, then around uh, um, the uh, five and four areas where it gets a little bit more complicated. So a five is kind of like a top, the top end of the C grade and the, the lower end of the B grade. 
the four is kind of the, the sort of lower end of the C grade. And then obviously below that, we have three, two, and one as well, okay? Generally, a four is considered a pass. Sometimes you will see on things, the difference between a pass and a good pass. So sometimes a four is considered the pass, five is considered the good pass. Um, so if you're looking at colleges, universities, those sorts of things, look at what their requirements are. Um, but hopefully that's helped very, very briefly explain some of the grading system there as well. We're now going to welcome our heads of department for some of our creative subjects. So um, I will welcome uh, Miss Soberton, who is head of art uh, and is also going to be able to speak a little bit about photography uh, uh, this evening, a new option that we're able to offer this year, rather excitingly. Um, Miss Daly, um, who's going to be here to speak about art textiles, and Mr. Newell, uh, who is here to speak about 3D design. Um, so first of all, welcome and good evening. Uh, um, and um, I want to first of all just emphasise to everyone that this, this is the group of subjects where students can only choose one out of this group of subjects, okay? So you've got four subjects in this group, uh, art, um, uh, textiles, uh, photography, and 3D design, and students can only choose one of those four. So that's something to, to consider carefully. Um, First thing to kind of uh, um, uh, ask really is um, around um, kind of equipment um, and things that students might need for any of the courses, uh, especially for photography. So uh, Miss Overton, you can speak about art as well while we're with you, but okay. especially photography, any, any specialist equipment that students might need. Um, well, for all our courses, we want students to have um, a folder to put their work in. Um, at home, they, they do need access to materials like um, fine liners, white gel pens, um, any kind of paints and brushes. For photography particularly, they need access to a camera. A phone camera is fine, but they do need to have um, access to one that they can use independently. So they, they might be able to use one at school, but they definitely need them for their homework. And, um, and a computer as well, because they're going to have to do some digital manipulation as well, which can be the Chromebook, of course. OK, uh, Miss Daly, then over to you. Um, so I guess in terms of our textiles, obviously it's a winner if you've got a sewing machine at home, because it means that you can, um, you can get on with some of the more practical work that we do in school. But at a bare minimum, we actually ask students to buy a pack when they come in, and that just contains kind of the basics like um, scissors and threads, needles, um, and also includes some sketchbooks and color, watercolor paints as well. And what we tend to find is over the GCSE course, the students kind of build upon the basic pack that they have. And that's really useful because by the time they get to year 11, they can kind of work very independently at home. Perfect. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Newell? Uh, yes, yeah, very similar to art textiles as well. Um, we have a DT pack that you can purchase at the start of year nine. Uh, we do require all students to have a sketchbook as a minimum for doing their work in and the drawings and a lot of the design um, that you will be doing at home as part of your home learning for the coursework portfolio. Um, all the packs uh, that we uh, sell through school, which are usually the cheapest places and the cheapest way to buy the materials, um, contain everything you need. The only thing I would say for 3D design, obviously, it is an expensive subject. We do use resistant materials such as polymers, plastics, um, metal and uh, timbers, which, of course, the school can purchase and get for uh, probably the most affordable prices you could buy. But we do ask students to contribute towards that. And that is at the moment this year is £20, but the price of materials is going up very, very steeply at the moment, particularly with what's going on in the world. And that is affecting um, our costs. So we will be asking students to contribute towards uh, the materials and that covers for the projects that you make uh, in year 9, 10 and 11, but we do have to ask for that payment every year for the next three years. So for the, the cost of the course over three years, be somewhere around about probably £60 or so split £20 each year, if that kind of makes sense. It is an expensive subject, so it's something to think about. Can um, I just break in as well? Just to, sorry, Ms. Just, Overton, carry on. Sorry, just so that um, we also can provide an art pack and that would be at a price of £30 if you bought it from us. But um, they definitely need the folder and they will need to buy sketchbooks, um, which again, we can provide cheaper, but they are welcome to go and source their own as well. 
Yeah, and, and actually just to kind of add, we also ask students to pay for the materials um, through school. They can go out and buy them themselves, but we get um, a better cost reduction if we buy in bulk. Yeah, perfect. So um, just on that, um, obviously, you know, I, I, I want to emphasize, I want, you know, students to be able to do uh, subjects that they feel really passionately about uh, and are going to really enjoy. So um, please, please, please do not uh, um, feel that you cannot choose a subject purely on financial grounds. If there is, uh, if that is a concern, and we are aware, obviously, especially as Mr. Newell mentioned, some of the things going on in the world, we do completely understand that that may be a concern. Please do get in touch uh, with myself or Miss Shadbolt completely confidentially, um, um, and uh, so we're aware of, of support that may be necessary. And the school is more than happy to do that. Um, and please, I want to emphasise again: I do not want any students' options to be limited if the financial reason is the only reason why you're, you're considering not doing a subject. We will uh, find a way to help. Uh, support you where uh, where we can. So please do get in touch if that's something that uh, you'd like to. And again, I emphasise that would be completely confidentially, um, and you can just email me if 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 you'd like to uh, to do that. Um, in terms of uh, project work, obviously all your subjects include quite a lot of project work, um, and. Um, you know, what sort of uh, proportion would students be expected to do outside of the classroom? What proportion would students have to do at home? Um, certainly, I often walk past DT or R after school, there's students in there. Can you give some sort of idea around sort of time commitments and also what students are, are doing in that time as well? Uh, so again, if we go around starting with uh, Miss Overton. Okay. Um, I mean, it if you want to get a very high grade, the same with any subject, you need to put lots of time and effort into it. So the more you the more you put in, the more you get out of it. Um, for pretty much all the art, creative arts, I would say um, it's very independent, the research that they're supposed to be doing. So they would be expected to do quite a lot of homework. A lot of fine art and photography will be finishing things. So they might do, say, lino printing in art, and um, they might not have finished presenting it in their sketchbook. So they'd be expected to finish those things off for homework. But there'd be quite a lot of independent work, like um, taking photographs, um, doing extra drawings, um, finding an art, finding artists that are going to inspire their artwork. So these those things have to be independent. They have to find them themselves. We can give support after school. Um, but yeah, a lot of that kind of thing has to be done independently. We have a lot of students coming up after school, Wednesdays, Thursdays, Fridays. Um, we help each other and, um, you know, they get advice. They can use our equipment. Um, yeah, so it, it, it's quite um, quite full um, during the week after school. Okay. I, okay. I might just, yeah, I might just add to Ms. what Ms. Overton says. I think the expectation across subjects is the same. You know, I know school kind of recommends certain times. But I do know the students who achieve best and make most progress do actually put extra time into their into their sketchbooks. The other thing that I would say, and I'm sure Miss Overton and Mr. Newell agree with me, the nature of the course, because there's no exam, it's very much based on a portfolio. So if your child is not a child who's consistent with getting their homework done, they're going to run across quite a few problems because there simply is no kind of winging it and kind of doing it all at the end there has to be a real consistency like certainly in year nine but very importantly from year 10 onwards because we do not go back and we do not revisit work it's really important that your your son or daughter is able to um your sorry your child is able to keep up with deadlines Perfect. Mr. Newell, anything to, to add there around work done outside the classroom? Yeah, I think one thing I would say for 3D design, obviously it re relies on the students being able to access the materials and the workshop machinery. Um, so the, the reality of it is that lesson times is used uh, a lot of the time for practical. Um, and again, as Miss Overton said, if you want to access the higher levels, the sevens, eights and nines, uh, then you're going to have to be putting in the extra hours. And that does include sometimes lunch times or after schools. At the moment, I'm in school. I've still got year 11s here. Um, we've been doing uh, one night, most year 11s are doing one night after school. And we've been doing that since January. So, um, you know, the re reality is we need access to the workshop and the materials to do that. We can't do the practical at home. 
Um, so it does mean you do have to put in the extra hours um, outside of the lesson times because three 50 minute uh, lessons in a week is just not enough time to make your practical outcomes in a lot of cases. So if you are aiming for those higher grades, that's definitely something that I would say um, you will need to be prepared to do. In terms of home learning outside of school, um, we recommend an, an hour, obviously, um, but that depends on where we are in the projects and everything we do um, across all subjects because we don't have the exams. It pays dividends come sort of April, May time when the other exam subjects are gearing up for the academic subjects because all your coursework and your portfolio work is done. But that does mean the investment has to really start straight away in year nine, particularly in year 10 and year 11 to get those hours in to make your coursework portfolio there. The advantage is, of course, you've got no exam to worry about. So come about April, end of April, there is nothing more to worry about in your subject. So it pays off at the end, but it does mean the work has to go in and it has to start really when you hit the ground running in year nine. Perfect. And I, I think it's really important to consider that, especially in consider a, a kind of the, the group of subjects and the combination of subjects. And this is one of the reasons why actually from this group, we, we only allow students to take one uh, because there is a, a fairly significant time commitment and some other subjects I'm sure later we'll, we'll talk about similar time commitments practical subjects for example where rehearsal or things might be might be required um, so it is important to think about the the, the uh, kind of breadth of subjects that are being selected and therefore the type of work that will be required and balancing the commitments of those subjects but as Mr Newell says there is a bit of payback then in that as you're going into your uh, um, written examinations at the end of year 11, some of the practical stuff by then is is done. So actually um, the um, um, so actually the kind of uh, um, balance there um, is something uh, that um, it's important to consider not just from a time point of view but also to consider for, um, getting a, a balanced selection of subjects as well uh, and how different subjects may complement each other to get a really balanced kind of uh, curriculum. Um, just one last question. Um, I, I asked the, the um, heads of the EBAC subjects exactly the same thing. Hopefully the, this, the um, start of um, some of our uh, trips and the wider school life is starting to open back up again. Uh, whilst obviously we're not going to promise anything this evening, um, are there any sort of uh, uh, trips or things that, that you're thinking of running or have run successfully in the past uh, that might be, and I say we're, we're going to caveat everything now with the uh, thing of we don't know what's going to happen, but are there any extra opportunities that, that might arise as part of some of your subjects? Um, I know that the creative arts, and that includes the art textiles, um, art fine art and drama um i know uh, sorry and 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 the and the trade design i know that we've kind of in the pipeline started to think about a potential trip to new york next year i know that miss overton and myself in the past have done quite a lot of gallery trips and actually more importantly we've had some artists come in and work in schools so that's a really good opportunity as well so that's definitely something kind of in the pipeline at the moment yeah, we tend to do a gallery trip every every year, uh, or or at least a location trip. One in year nine, one in year ten, and one in year eleven for their sort of exam board theme as well. Yeah, I think we've talked about, haven't we, Miss Daly, about um, possible exhibitions like new designer exhibitions or um, trips up to London for things like collecting your own photography to create your own uh, primary research of architecture and things like that. So we're definitely looking at trips, but obviously the last two years we haven't been able to, to do that as a department because of, of COVID. But yeah, we certainly do want to add trips as part of our extracurricular um, research as well. Perfect. Um, listen, thank you very much to uh, all of you. Sorry, Miss Overton. One, yeah, one I'm thing. really sorry, but just um, the three of us, we're, we're planning to have some students talk about um, the courses oh. on Thursday after school this week, just 15 minutes after school in the Riley studio for any student who wants to come and listen to other students talking about the courses, you know, the highs and the lows maybe of, of what goes on. And they can actually, they'll be showing some of their work as well. So I think that would be really useful for any student who's thinking about photography, fine art, DT or textiles to come along and, and listen to that. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. And and perhaps if we can get a message out as part of uh, in tutor as well, just to remind uh, uh, mm -hmm. students of that as well, that would be fantastic. So thank you very much for offering that. Listen, thank you very much to all of you for your time this evening. We're going to let you now go and enjoy the rest of your uh, of your evening. And um, 
uh, we will then welcome our uh, next set of uh, heads department and subject leads. So um, um, coming up now, we have um, our heads of um, uh, drama, dance and music about to join us. Uh, for this bit, um, Ms. Shabol is going to be leading this bit. Uh, so I will uh, welcome her back now. Um, and, Hello. Um, we will uh, <coughs> also welcome uh, Mrs. Townsend, Head of Drama, and uh, Mrs. Turnbull, um, Head of uh, Music. Um, I think Ms. Potter is just joining us. Um, so we can now also welcome uh, Ms. Potter, um, who uh, leads on dance. Ms. Shabba, Hi, everyone. Hello, evening ladies. Hi. Um, right, I would just like to make this point so our students and our parents are aware that you cannot take dance with PE or sports science. That is correct, yeah. Right, so on to some questions, ladies. So one for music. Um, do you need to already play an instrument? You don't need to already play. But if you are going to take GCSE music, you need to be starting to learn to play an instrument. It's 30% of the GCSE. So if you don't have an instrument, then you're going to struggle to gain 30% of the mark. So you don't have to have been starting um, already, you know, already be grade two or three or something. But you do need to be learning. If you're going to put it on your GCSE form as an option, then you need to be starting lessons straight away. OK, so we don't teach how to play an instrument in the GCSE lessons. That's something you learn externally, but you do need to have an instrument. OK. Are there um, any instruments that would not be accepted? I mean, if I came along and wanted to play my recorder. A uh, recorder is absolutely fine. Yeah, that's yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I'm studying that at degree level, so there's no reason why I do it for GCSE. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Um, dance. Yes. Um, what existing skills or knowledge is required? Um, so generally, wouldn't really say they need to have any existing skills um, to take the GCSE. The main thing would be just that they have rhythm. So as long as they can actually, you know, dance to a beat and to a, a song, that is going to be one of the requirements like if they think that they can do that or you know parent care or whoever who's watched them is confident that they have the ability to do that brilliant but it's quite a common question where the students or families ask if they have had to have done a um dance outside of school and that the answer would be no no like just as long as they can hold a beat yeah their foot. yeah and then we can do the rest and it's all very much about you know creating dances themselves expanding how they can choreograph, learning things from um, dance teachers, etc. from there. Lovely. Um, drama. Hi. Hello. Um, how much practical is involved? Well, in terms of percentage of the course, 30% um, of it is practical and 70% theory. Um, but we do do lots of practical and lessons because like even the even the texts that we explore that we have to do for a written exam, for example, which is Blood Brothers, we will you know read sections in class and we'll act bits out. So we, we try and use practical as much as possible. And it just depends on where we are in the course. We always start year nine with real practical and we kind of dip in and out of it throughout the year. And the singles are often in classrooms, but not always. So it just sort of depends which bit we're doing. But we do try and do it as much practical as possible. Um, because that's what the students, that's why we do drama after yeah. all. <laughs> so what are the written components on the drama GCSE? What do they have to do for those parts? So there's two parts really. So um, one part is a big log book, which they can do at home. We do in class as well, which is kind of reflecting on a practical process that we go through when they devise their own piece of drama. So um, that's in three sections and we kind of help lead them through that. So that's kind of done on the side, if you like. And there's one written examination, which is about Blood Brothers, a set text. And it's all from an actor's perspective. So it is different. Though it's got English elements, it is different because it's about costume design for a character or how you play the role of. Yep. And we also do a live review question. So we go to the theatre or we watch something and then we talk about it. Um, and then theatre trips. What trips would drama students be able to go? What would you 
be able well, to. Well, we just try and, I mean, it's been a bit of a funny few years, obviously, but I'm really keen on getting students to the theatre because I think that's where the learning takes place, like seeing it for real. So um, we took Year 11 to see Blood Brothers. That's fortuitously on at Woking in the autumn. So that's been great. And we're in the process of planning a trip for Year 9 and 10 at the moment. Um, so we haven't found the right play yet, but it's in process. So definitely once a year. And we've all, I've also booked a theatre company to come in um, at the end of March to do a performance, a Brecht style performance for our GCC cohort and some year eights as well. So we've got that to look forward to as well. Um, other ladies, what about trips for you? Are there any that you would think of doing or? Um, very similar sort of to obviously Mrs Townsend where we haven't been able to do any, where dance is such a new subject we haven't had a dance trip run yet. Um, so it would have been amazing to get some of our dancers on um, a trip. There are definitely loads around, especially like being near Guildford. Um, so we're definitely in process of having a search if we can get any last minute trips involved this year, um, especially for obviously our year 11s who are leaving us quite soon, but je definitely for our 10s and 9s, um, there'll be some trips to go and see some productions, whether that is what they actually study at GCSE, it you know wouldn't really matter. Like what Mrs. Townsend said, it's great to just see people perform on stage, and that's where we learn. So that's definitely in the pipeline to organise, but just hasn't been able to happen due to COVID. Same here for music as well. <laughs> I don't need to say anymore. <laughs> Same situation. <laughs> Hope to do some in the future. Um, I have a question come through. It says, "Is um, music production part of the music GCSE?" No. So it's 30% performance, 30% composition, which is writing your own music. And then the other 40% is listening and praising. So we have um, eight set works and then we study, analyse those. And um, that is a written paper. So composing. So they have to make their own piece of music. Yes. Yes. They compose do two compositions. One's free. So completely up to their and their own style. Um, so one of my highest scoring pieces this year has actually been a drum and bass piece. Um, and then um, we do one to a set um, set work. Um, so a set brief, so it might be composing a piece of film music or um, composing a ternary form piece. So it'll be linked to one of the set works and the exam board will give us that um, brief for them to complete in year 11. Um, Miss Potter. Yes. My child chooses dance mm -hmm. and they're performing really well. Yeah. Would there be opportunities for me to come in as a parent, do you think, at any point to see what their, their dance skills are like? Definitely. So that would be more of a dance show. So yep. we obviously, again, uh, due to COVID, would normally have had a, what used to be um, called Celebration of Dance. And that was more sort of um, involved in the PE side of things. And then obviously I sort of took it away from them and took that on. And we did Celebration of Dance um, a couple of years ago. And But that was before sort of GCSE dance was really around. So they didn't really have any uh gcc dance pieces but that was definitely would be something we bring back in put a dance show on and that would allow all of the students to whatever they've worked on that year maybe take a favorite piece they could perform that if they wanted to do two they can do two so just sort of like a, a celebration of dance with which any student could be in even if they don't take gcc dance but also allows the other year groups to yeah. show their pieces oh, that would be great Nice to see one of those. What about drama? Did, would we be able to see any of their their pieces? Yeah, definitely. We're planning at the moment for year 10. They've got their um, devised performance exam in early May. And so um, me and Miss Collier are in the process of choosing a date, I think, just after the exam, because of the studio is a bit too small to have parents in. So this is the tricky thing. So a couple of days after the exam, we're looking at having a hall and um, inviting parents to watch the pieces because the students need to be shown off <laughs> with their talent. Mm. And so it's definitely something that we'd like to be able to do now we can. <laughs> and music the same? Do you think we might be able to, parents might be able to? Yep, so we've got um, a GCC showcase concert coming up, which will be for year nine. So they'll be showcasing their work um, and we'll do that every year. So um, that will be part of the course. We'll all play so people will either do solo or ensemble or both if they want to. Um, and parents can come in and watch what their, um, what their uh, students are doing. Lovely. Um, Miss Potter, in the dance GCSE, because this yep. is a whole new GCSE to me. I wasn't even around when I was young. Yeah. Is there a written element to yours as well? Yes, so it's 60% practical and 40% theory. So we're really fortunate that it's uh, 
more what it highlighted yeah. on the really pattern too. side yeah <laughs> no you know the way it probably should be um so in terms of the written they have an hour and a half uh paper so just the one paper um and that is on six professional works um which they study well not all six they with they learn six and four come up in the paper um they the questions will also be based on their own choreography so it might ask how they used feedback in their creating of their choreography um, and also just other bits. So from year nine all through, through to year 11, it's split into three sections and it makes up an hour and a half written paper. Yep. Um, another one for you. Yeah. Kit. What do they yeah. wear? So kit. So generally um, we say it would all be all black, um, black leggings and a black top. So they there is um, a GCC dance kit that I sort of designed with Link Up, which is just black leggings that has sort of a silver FHS on the leg. And they can get their initials on that as well if they wish. And then they have a plain black T-shirt has our logo on the front. And then on the back, it says GCC dance. And again, yep. they can have their initials on it as well. Obviously, sometimes the girls do or the girls and boys, they do forget their dance kit or they might their dance top might be in the wash. If they've brought in a plain black T-shirt, that's fine. But generally, I would ask for them to wear their GCC dance kit. What about footwear? Because when I use when I think about dance, you think about ballet, tap, modern, and they have all yeah. these different shoes. It's just barefoot, so shoes and socks off. All right. Oh. <laughs> but they can also buy things um that are called like foot thongs and they're just very like like flip flops but they're just like yep. a fabric bit that just goes on the front of the foot and that just allows them to sort of move and turn but that is not you know it's not a requirement okay so i've just some questions that are coming to my head from a yes, parent's point absolutely of view. fine um right so i've got from, from music um uh, for the music performance exam is it individual only or can it be a group? So you do both. So 15% of the 30% is um, a solo performance um, and that is uh, needs to be about a minute and a half long. Um, if it is a piece that's meant to have accompaniment, then you need to be playing without the accompaniment as well. Um, and then you do a group performance as well. So we call it an ensemble performance and that's the other 15%. Um, and then you will do both of those. So we'll work on them. So you do lots of kind of um, sort of mock ones um, throughout the course of the year. And then in year 11, you'll have an exam day where you come in and you do your solo performance and then you do your um, ensemble performance as well. Okay, lovely. Um, is there anything that any of you ladies can think of that we haven't asked that are really important bits of information that students should know prior to picking their options? I think just they just need to, if they're stuck, just pick something they enjoy as mm -hmm. well. Like it's really important that with, I think, our kind of um, subjects that if they enjoy it, that's a really big element of it um so i think if there are you know any questions where they're worried that they might not be good enough and they don't want to ask them here like obviously come and see us at any point but it's just really important that they enjoy the subject but also need to be willing to perform as well so just if you enjoy it but you feel a little bit shy in an audience maybe have a think because that's you know you're going to be assessed in a, in a camp front of a camera or an audience so that, that is that is very true. I hadn't thought about that one. They need to be able to get up in front of a crowd. Don't yeah, they? yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I think also there needs to be um, a slight willingness as well. Um, I don't know if this is for dra dra drama and dance as well, but to to actually explore other kind of for us styles of music, you know, um, because we do explore a massive range and um, right from the Brock, so from the sixteen hundreds to to Killer Queen and and um, film music. But we need to make sure we've come with an open mind, you know. Bring your instrument. We're going to be playing. Um, it might be the melody from a piece of Bach, you know, or it might be a bit of Pink Floyd's. But you've got to be able to actually have a go and not just go, oh well, I don't like that kind of music, you know. You've got to have a go at all of it because at the end of the day the building blocks of how pink floyd wrote their piece is the exact same as bark so you know we're going to learn about all of that so they have a massive you know open mind to really really explore everything and the same with miss potter you've got to be willing to bring your instrument on and i say okay right come on let's all play this we're going to go we can't have anyone going oh no you know do you just go because we're all friends in the class and just have that willingness to just you know it doesn't matter if we make mistakes because that in the end of the day that's how we learn so yeah an openness and willingness to join in and have a bit of fun 
I would echo both of what Miss Potter and Miss Temple said there. Absolutely. <laughs> Enjoyment, love for the subject, yeah. and just giving it a go and sort of trusting your teachers that we will guide you through. And as long as you're willing at your game and you're going to get stuck in and that you do enjoy performing and, and you like that, then then you'll be you'll be absolutely fine. Perfect. Right. Perfect. Mr. Newman Thanks. has come back as if to say, time's up, ladies. <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. It was, it's, it's been great to listen to all the, all the fantastic stuff uh, there from some of our practical subjects. So, so thank you very much. We're going to say thank you now to uh, our heads of uh, uh, drama, dance and music. So you can go and enjoy your evenings now. Uh, so thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your thank time. You. Uh, and we're going to move on to our next uh, uh, group of subjects. Um, so um, in a moment, we will be moving on to um, uh, we'll, we will be moving on in just a moment to um, computing statistics and um, enterprise um, and thinking about uh, some of the options uh, around there and some sort of common questions for those subjects as well. So we are going to welcome uh, Mr. Code uh, representing statistics. Uh, Mr. Bates representing computer science and Mr. Sneddon representing enterprise BTEC. Um, so start off with uh, a couple of questions from our Google form that we sent out in advance. Uh, first of all, Mr. Sneddon, if I can come to you, a couple of questions around the BTEC itself and how this is different to a, 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 to a GCSE course. Um, and also whether that's different in terms of what you can go on to study afterwards. Yeah, so um, the BTEC course is a lot more vocational based. Um, so we look at a lot more in terms of skills and characteristics of entrepreneurs. And to do that, we offer um, sessions with entrepreneurs from the local areas. So we get live speakers in to speak to the classes. So it's a lot more hands on in terms of that. And it's more project based in the terms that the coursework elements um, are project based with writing assignments based on the, the businesses that we've looked at from our guest speakers. And then also setting up a business plan for a business idea that you have, um, which is a lot more involved in terms of the students working rather than it being textbook work and just learning all of the um key vocabulary we still do that but it's more of a a live way of doing it other than the GCSE um, and then obviously there is an exam element as well so we learn all about accounting and finance um, which is a very useful skill too uh, there is nothing holding you back then to do the A level if you decide that actually business is the way you want to go so you can still study the A level after doing a BTEC and we do the level two BTEC which is equivalent to a GCSE so it is recognized perfect I think that's a really important point as well obviously you know some some people I know aren't as familiar with the different types of qualification but the BTEC the, the level two BTEC is equivalent to a GCSE and therefore in terms of sort of future study and things like that, that there's still plenty of options uh, open yes. to you um computing uh, uh coming to you uh, now what other subjects would you suggest uh might kind of complement com computing for someone who is interested in a career in that area in the future. Um, are there specific things or, or skills uh, that you would encourage them to develop alongside obviously taking computer science GCC? Yeah, absolutely. So um, a lot of students do pick computing as part of a future career. And um, it's, it's a subject that students have done in year eight where They've actually experienced a lot of different uses of computing. So, for example, they've done projects in programming and we've done projects in uh, more creative fields as well. So it really um, it really depends on what type of computing career that they want to have. So if they feel strongly about becoming a programmer or a software engineer, um, then having a good grasp of maths and physics would help with with that um, branch of, of, of computer science. Um, however, some students um, like to combine computing and computer science with um, with art and design and use it for engineering or architecture um, because you again you can use the skills in that area as well so it, it's um, it's definitely a subject that fits well with other subjects whichever order that you pick them in um, even things like PE and dance and drama there there is a vast uh, vast amount of technology in those fields so you think about all the recent technology that's been going into 
uh, into like football and and all of the other sort of sports and then also all the production um, equipment and production that happens in drama and dance so it, it's it's a subject that does definitely support other subject other career paths not just computing Lovely, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Code, coming to you, uh, quite simply, uh, what is statistics? Yes, um, so welcome data fans. Um, what I would say is uh, statistics is, is, is a broad and wide brush whereby you are looking, investigating and analysing data of many, many different kinds. So, for example, um, recently... Uh, we have been investigating data, for example, on car insurance claims. We um, have been investigating data on different holiday types. We've scrutinised the Premier League. So we're basically taking loads and loads of data, data analysis techniques and applying it to any range of data you like. And it comes back to what uh, Mr. Bate was saying there. It can. There are a range of subjects that statistics will be valuable for, certainly through the GCSE and definitely A-level. Any subject in terms of a level that's got um sort of quantitative methods with it statistics is really really helpful so i you know um from that from that point of view it's two one hour and a half papers as well um but actually the thing i would say about that is even though it's exam based it could be higher or foundation and all of the day all of the papers are based on real life data so the message is mr newman we're studying everything and everything with a statistics lens Perfect. Thank you very much. I just noticed in our live uh, our live stream there a couple of questions about computing. So, Mr. Bay, if we just come back to you, one about coding, and then also about the link to archaeology, which is a really interesting question as well. So, could you just address those uh, forwards, please? Yeah, that, that is an interesting question. So, um, when it comes to programming or coding, um, there will be a lot of coding in the uh, in the three years that we study computing for. So you have to be prepared for that. It is something that if you found, uh, I mean, right by now, all of the all of the year eight students have actually had a taster of what we would do in the GCSE. So we've we just completed a unit on programming with Python to give them an idea about how they feel about that um, that uh, that skill set. Um, and if they've really found that frustrating, then they're going to find the next three years quite frustrating because we we do um, in our we have a two hour lesson and a one hour lesson in our two hour lesson we do a lot of programming in there and that's to help with our paper two which is all about computational thinking and algorithm design um and whilst the the course itself is not uh, there's no programming that's examined as in there's, there's no project work um we do a lot of project work to get them ready for the paper-based exam so it is something you have to uh, for some for some people they really enjoy programming and for other people, you know, that was quite a frustrating experience. And it is not a skill that everyone uh, wants to do for the next three years. So that's definitely a good a deciding factor if you're kind of on the fence is to think about, you know, how did you feel about programming? Uh, and then linking it with archaeology. So, yeah, there is, you know, a huge, a tremendous amount of um, of technology that's being used in archaeology. And, and we often think of archaeology. I was actually when I was at, when I was in year eight, I was in the uh, Bagshot Archaeology Club. Um, so I spent my Saturdays doing that. And actually, you tend to think of like, you know, with a trowel in the field, but actually a lot of archaeology is, is as Mr. Code will, will attest to, you know, a data based and, and uh, you know, driven by statistics and historical information and records and trying to piece together actual data sets and, and working out, uh, working out um, new, new discoveries based on data and information. So having a good solid foundational skills in being able to understand what these numbers mean, but from a computational way and also as you know, as, as a statistical way, it would really benefit that um, that uh, career path as well. Yeah, if I could, if I could come in there, uh, Mr. Newman, I see that I think it's Josh has asked the question there. Um, I, I would say that overall, um, if we took st a statistical data. Um, if we thought about be it carbon dating and matching carbon dating to the age, the age of um, the, the, uh, the, the, the different artifacts that are found and so on, we can find data sets around archaeology. And that would be one thing that I would say in terms of statistics, you can find a data set on anything and everything. And archaeology, there would certainly be um, quantitative methods as part of that. Lovely, thank you. Um, Ms. Nedden, coming back to you around sort of, uh, um, you mentioned briefly earlier about A-level, but just more broadly, kind of what sort of uh, uh, future paths, either in terms of study or career, um, do you think enterprise would be particularly uh, useful for? 
Well, obviously, I'm sure we've all seen shows like Dragon's Den and um, Lord Sugar uh, with The Apprentice. Um, so we are producing entrepreneurs of the future, basically. So having a look at the things that we look closely at where we are planning businesses and looking at how to do that. Obviously, it does fit nicely into those people who want to set up a business because they have some brilliant ideas. However, it also links very closely um, with anybody who wants to do any sort of market research that links nicely with um, what Mr. Code was saying as well about analysing data because we do a whole section on market research. Um, and also, if you want to go into the marketing and promotion field, so if you're looking at a career based around marketing and promoting other businesses, we, we do a whole section on that as well. So realistically, any type of business and accountancy that you want to look at in terms of a future career, not just business owners, we look at all of those types of areas. So the whole business field for any industry, really. Perfect. Thank you. And uh, I'm, I'm sure there's lots of transferable skills anyway. You mentioned earlier accountancy, budgeting, these sorts of things. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I would argue that's also quite useful just for life. Exactly. So, uh, yeah. uh, some, some excellent transferable skills uh, uh, there as well. I think I come back to a point I made earlier as well about thinking about the combination of subjects that you're taking and trying to get some balance in there. Thinking about, you know, well, OK, fine, you know, I'm, maybe I'm doing, say, history in a language or geography in a language then what else am I putting in there to kind of balance? Maybe something creative and then maybe, you know, one of the subjects that we see represented on screen right now, you know, kind of to get that real balanced curriculum um, is really, really important. So, you know, even if you think you're going to go down one specific path, um, one, it's good to keep your options open. When I was in year eight, I'd have told you I wanted to be a doctor. Uh, uh, then I realised I didn't really like ill people very much. Um, and I wasn't, uh, you know, science wasn't really my thing either. And perhaps that dream wasn't going to work out. Uh, so, um, but also, um, not only to keep options open, but also universities, employers, etc., want to see uh, a well-rounded person with different skills and interests not just someone who's kind of you know uh, uh you know kind of got got skills only in one area so it's really important to think about uh, one last question before i let the three of you go and enjoy your evening is again about computing so lots of questions unsurprisingly the computing fans are great at submitting the questions online um is um what practical activities are there as part of the computing course mr bain yeah so we, we actually uh, try and teach all of our concepts even the theory-based concepts in a in a practical way so for example when we're looking at the how the cpu works and the internal um, logic behind how um how computers do maths we will actually kind of human model that so we'll pretend to be the different parts of the computer and do it that quite practically um, and then we actually have programming which is genuine programming it's learning a real language it's not learning a, a you know a language just for schools it's it's the genuine skills that you can transfer into the workplace going forward um, and then also uh, when we study networking, and this is something that our year nines and year tens will start to enjoy in the summer term, we uh, we actually build a small network uh, with some desktop PCs. We actually do the full build and uh, make it work completely working system. So de you definitely have hands-on experience, and um, especially you know especially with programming and, and working with the Chromebooks, which are obviously is every lesson we're using those Chromebooks. Um, to uh, as part of the as, as part of our teaching school excellent thank you um is there anything else um we've got about a minute left if there's anything else that any of you would like to add otherwise i'm going to let you go and enjoy your evenings no, I, I, well, I, I, that, that was great from um nicely chaired mr newman nicely chaired lovely okay thank you very much then for, to all of you for your time uh please go enjoy your evening um I've enjoyed it already sir uh, uh, shortly welcome um, our uh, representatives from our next set of subjects. So we've got uh, uh, PE um, on the way. Um, we've also got um, uh, psychology um, joining us as well. So that's Mr. Ryder and Mrs. Perkis uh, joining us. Um, uh, just to, as a reminder from the start, anyone who wasn't here right at the start, uh, I did give apologies on behalf of Miss Lua, who can't be here this evening. Um, but she has said that uh, she will um, um, happily answer any email questions that students may have. Um, and also, um, I will uh, try and uh, add in a few bits of information where I can during this next section. So 
Um, welcome to uh, Mr. Ryder, now uh, Head of PE, and uh, to Mrs. Perkis, who leads on psychology. Um, so thank you both for joining us and good evening to both of you. Um, first of all, coming to you, Mr. Ryder, first, um, obviously we've got uh, uh, um, PE and sports and science, okay. one's a GCSE, one's a Cambridge National. We've had quite a lot of questions come through about why are there two courses? What are the differences? Uh, so if you could just run through that with us, that'd be great. Yes, absolutely. Uh, good evening, everyone, firstly. Mr. Ryder, I think oh, you're currently on mute. Oh, I'm on mute. Is that better now? Can you hear me now? Okay, I might just uh, go to Mr. Perkins while I, while hopefully we could try and sort sort out your microphone uh, um, uh, there for just a moment. Um, so uh, obviously, Mr. Perkins, psychology is not a subject that is um, um, offered to Key Stage Three. So, what kind of things should students expect as part of the psychology course when they start if they choose it in Year Nine? I think one of the things that they need to be really, really aware of is that they've got um, no background knowledge at all of psychology. So quite a lot of their other option subjects that they choose, so if it's history or geography or RE or the modern foreign language, they've already got a really good baseline knowledge of it that, that they've built on through probably all the way through their primary education and their first two years of their secondary education. If they're to choose psychology GCSE, they re they've got nothing kind of to fall back on. There's no base for them to build on. Um, and some students have found that quite difficult when they've not got that base. Absolutely everything that they learn in their psychology lessons is new to them. And it's a, a, a very steep learning curve in the September when they start with lots and lots of key terms and lots of new terminology that they have to learn. I've found that students that really enjoy using their knowledge organisers properly in the way that they should be done, they're the ones that have been successful with psychology because they've put the time and the effort in to really, really learn that they're kind of those key words. And if, if, if a student, if it's not something that they're perhaps as keen on doing, shall I say, then it might not be the best choice for one of their GCSE options. Perfect. And I guess as well, they get to understand why we do the knowledge organising. Indeed, and that's the very, very first topic that we look at on memory and why it is the theory behind why we learn in that way. Um, and that is the, one of the first things that we learn about in September. Brilliant. Um, and, you know, I, I guess that will help with, with lots of revision and those sorts of things as well, once, once you understand some of that stuff. Um, also, um, students may know you as a science teacher. So one of the questions we had is, is how much science is involved and, and what, what, how much crossover is there between okay. science and scientific well, knowledge well, and psychology? Psychology is the scientific study of human behaviour. So all of, um, in each of the topics that we do, we look at two theories and two research studies um, about, to do with that particular area of psychology. And the real emphasis on the fact that any research that has been done is done in a scientific manner with independent and dependent variables. So a lot of the key terms from a practical perspective in science overflow straight away into psychology. And then from a content point of view, um, there's an overlap with some of the stuff to do. We do a, co a topic on the brain in our psychology course. Those students that are doing separate science at GCSE will also do uh, content work on the brain. And then there's a common overlap with things like the nervous system, which uh, all students at GCSE look at the nervous system. And then again in psychology as well. Lovely. Thank you very much. Um, I obviously mentioned that Miss uh, Lua can't be here. Thank you very much to Mrs. Da to Miss Daly for coming back uh, with one of her other hats on. Um, so uh, obviously she was here earlier for um, uh, art textiles. Now coming back uh, to talk about food as well, which uh, she also teaches uh, um, a, a, a bit of as well. Um, in terms of food, so a, a common question here, I think, is often the balance between you know, time spent cooking and theory based. So if you could just give us a bit of an understanding of both time allocation, but also in terms of the course and the assessment of the course, the balance of of those two things as well. 
Yeah, so it's interesting to listen to Miss Perkins talking about the crossover of science because I am not a science teacher, but I definitely feel like I teach a lot more science by because I actually teach the food nutrition course at GCSE and I currently have a year nine and a year 10 group. In fact, Miss Hellier took one of them, a cover lesson for Miss Lure today, and she just actually commented on the depth of the science that we go into. So the kind of theory aspect of the course, there is a lot of science. It's a lot around biology and nutrition and um, things like digestion that is all relevant to food. I'd also say there's a bit of crossover with geography. We look at fair trade, we look at food miles, we look at um, kind of global food issues as well. But that part of the course is assessed in an exam at the end of year 11, and that is actually worth 50% of the final market GCSE. Um, and the practical element of the course is 50%. However, that's kind of broken further down as well. So I guess the best example I could give you is 15% is scientific um, research through practical work. So say, for example, you're like making a lemon meringue pie, if I'm just giving you an example, it might be that you spend 15% of the time testing a meringue with different sugars, different temperatures, things like that. And then the other 35% of the exam is actually developing a menu that you would um, cook for uh, a consumer. So there is, we do spend 50% of our time cooking in the classroom. And the reason for that is we deliver quite a lot of the theory through the practical content um, in the classroom. Okay. Perfect, thank you very much. Um, Mr. Ryder, nice to, nice to see you again. Um, can we now hear you is the big question. Well, I hope so, is that better? Yay. Perfect, <laughs> lovely. So um, thank you very much for making a dash around the school to, uh, to, to, to do that. There you go, appropriate for PE. Um, so the, the question um, uh, that we were, we were about to answer there was around the differences between uh, the Cambridge National uh, and the GCSE option. So if you could just clarify what those two options are and the differences between them, please. Yeah, absolutely. So as you mentioned, we do offer two uh, two options at Key Stage 4. Uh, GCSE PE is focused heavily on the sports science uh, element, uh, and there's a, a big topic um, or a big coverage within that in regards to the percentage of, of, of the course. Um, so that would include uh, units such as anatomy and physiology, biomechanics and movement analysis, uh, and physical training. So very appropriate for kind of students that are looking to go down the route of um, perhaps sort of physiotherapy or um, kind of anything sports science based really. Um, we've got another element of the course as well, which is uh, slightly more, I suppose, holistic in, in nature as well. And we're looking at sports psychology, um, use of data in sport as well. Um, so one element of, of GCSE, uh, of the, the Key Stage 4 options is, is very much sports science heavy. Um, yes, there's a practical element within there as well. So 30% of the final grade is based on practical performance. Um, and 10%, the final 10% is based on a piece of coursework. So just to clarify, 10% uh, on coursework, 30% on, um, on a practical performance, and the final 60% is split across two papers, um, which is your sports science in, uh, paper, and then your other paper would be your sports psychology paper. Um, the other course, so the sports studies course, is very much more, uh, it's sort of less uh, exam based. So you're only 25% only of your final grade comes from an exam. Uh, the units are very different as well. So we're looking more at things like sports leadership. Uh, so students would perhaps want to go into um, more physical roles within sports. So things like uh, coaching, uh, we've had a look at some that kind of gone into sort of lifeguarding at, at sort of... Uh, you know, 16, 17, post-16 age groups. Um, and that kind of element where it is more it is more practical based, it is more practical, uh, practically assessed. I think the, the key thing to recognise is that all students, regardless of what they choose, will start on the GCSE PE course uh, in year nine, so the sports science course. Um, the reason for that is the content uh, for the Cambridge National course, um, so the, the sports studies course, is significantly less and therefore, we, we can cover that quite comfortably over two years. So students that, that perhaps at the end of year nine are best suited or perhaps based on what they want to be doing post-16 um, will be encouraged or will that, that conversation will happen with parents regarding going into going into the, uh, the, the sports studies course. So just, just to clarify, uh, regardless of decision at this stage, all students will start on, on GCSEP in year nine. And that gives them a really good base understanding of, of some key topics. I hope that clarifies it. Um, 
Oh, there was a question that I could see pop up about GCSE PE kit. Yes, students will receive a GCSE PE kit um, for both courses as well. Lovely. Thank you. One more question uh, that came through on our Google form there, Mr. Ryder, as well was, uh, can any sport be uh, assessed? Um, and, and do we have the abil ability and facilities to allow for that, those the range of sports in school as part of their GCSE uh, or indeed the Cambridge National uh, courses? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the vast majority of sports that students tend to participate in are assessed. Um, it's probably easier for me to tell you sports that aren't. Um, so rounders, for example, is a sport that was taken off the specification um, a few years back. Uh, other than that, um, the vast majority of sports, so we have horse riders, uh, skiers most years, snowboarders, uh, archery. So there is a real wide range of, of sports available to be assessed on alongside the more, um, I suppose, sort of mainstream sports that we, we cover in school. Um, so your footballs, hockeys, rugby, so on, basketball. Um, things like swimming as well. Unfortunately, we don't have access to, to swimming pools on site yet. Um, but, uh, but that is, again, a sport that can be assessed on and we always get sort of a handful of swimmers every year. Students are able to, to be assessed off-site. So when it comes to, to year 11 and we start to look at grading students, we will go off-site or we will speak to students' external coaches. Um, so going sort of horse riding and climbing is another option as well. So there is a real wide range of options. What I would encourage um, is if you sort of Google AQA GCSE PE sports, there is a full list of sports that students um, are able to participate in. And that's a combination of individual and team-based sports. Um, so rounders is the only one really that I think is a, a bit of a standout as, as a sport that cannot be assessed on. Uh, and sorry, last question just come through on the chat. Trampolining, yes or no? Yes, absolutely. Trampolining, dance, gymnastics, all able to be assessed. That's Perfect. All but important to, to clarify, we did mention this earlier with dance, though. You can't unfortunately do dance and either the PE options as GCSEs. <laughs> so you, there's potentially a decision there for some students uh, to make. Uh, Mrs. Perth, back, back, back to you, just uh, um, in terms of sort of future kind of pathways with psychology, uh, be it future study or careers, um, are there particular areas where you would recommend uh, psychology or, or particular areas that it lends itself particularly well to? I think um, anything where you're working with people, I think the, the skills that and the content that they learn from psychology is going to be useful. And we've talked to um, students, that a lot of the students this week have been watching a careers video focusing on some of those things, things to do with human resources, going into public services, marketing, as well as training as, as um, a psychologist themselves or clinical, educational, sports. There's so many different ranges of psychologists that people can go and work work into. What I would want to um, to say that, that um, you can go on to do, I did a psychology degree, but I do not have a psychology A-level. Um, you can do psychology A-level without psychology GCSE. It's not a prerequisite. Um, it's a course that would be enjoyed by students. And if they do the GCSE and then they go on to do the A-level, they will have a, a really, really good baseline for that A-level. It will give them a massive boost at the A-level in psychology if they've already got the GCSE, but it's not, a, it's not a prerequisite to do it. Perfect. Yeah, absolutely. And um, uh, um, yeah, I mean, I, I did psychology A-level, absolutely loved it. Um, but uh, I mean, psychology, G GCSE wasn't even an option. I mean, you know, so uh, um, students here are somewhat spoiled in the choice that they they have. I, I, I didn't I didn't even get that choice. But yeah, it's a uh, it's a great subject to choose. And it's really important to kind of think about that in terms of kind of, as you say, future, uh, uh, future things there as, um, as well. Um, can, I, can I just pop in and talk a little bit for a second, because I'm aware we're running out of time. I just like to kind of stress to the students who are interested in doing food and nutrition, that the students do try, we try and cook with the students kind of most weeks. There's a gap in the January where year 11s will be doing exams. So there is a period in that, in that term they don't cook as much. However, it is really essential that parents are able to check their children's Google classrooms and the students are able to um, organize themselves. Because of course, if a student comes in without their ingredients, they're missing 50% of the course of the, the they're missing 50% of the learning of the course. And those students who kind of forget ingredients on a regular basis are the ones that underachieve. So it's really important that um, parents, you're able to kind of 
help the students organize themselves when they're cooking. Perfect. Thank you very much. So um, thank you very much uh, um, to our um, heads of uh, psychology, PE and uh, uh, food there uh, for talking us through some of those options. Um, as with any of these uh, this evening, if you do have further questions, please go and speak to the relevant members of staff in school, uh, drop them an email, things like that. We're all here to support through this process. But thank you very much to the three of you uh, for your time this evening. We'll let you go and enjoy your evenings as well. Okay. All right, yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. Okay, and then for this uh, um, for this last group of uh, subjects, um, I'm going to hand uh, back over to uh, Miss Shadbolt, uh, who's going to lead this section, and we are going to welcome uh, Miss Bibby, um, head of uh, religion, philosophy, and ethics at GCSE. <laughs> Um, and Mrs. Code uh, representing media and also film studies, remembering the film is that uh, um, AS level that, that students would be contacted for uh, more specifically. Um, so, um, Ms. Shabal, over to you for this bit. Thank you. Um, right, let's start with Mrs. Code. Good evening. Good evening, Ms. Shabal. And um, media. Yeah. How much of the course is creative? Um, well, we try to make sure that students can learn creatively, but strictly the um, creative application of the knowledge that they gain is worth 30%. So that's the non-examined assessment. Um, so a brief comes out in the March of year 10 and features a variety, wide variety of um, options. And obviously they're all creative briefs, um, but we do do a lot of creative application, particularly in year nine, actually, to learn the learn the fundamentals of media studies. Um, Miss Bibby. Hello. Good evening. Good evening. Um, so your <clears throat> Mr. Newman introduced yours as I forgot it here, religion, philosophy, and ethics. Yeah. <clears throat> um I always thought it was just RE. No. Where you just learn about the religions. No, absolutely not. So we've decided that obviously our name needs to reflect everything that we teach. So we talk about religion, we do philosophy, and then 50% of our course is actually all the ethics components. So crime and punishment, how we make decisions, um, religion, life, euthanasia, abortion, and war. So how do we make decisions about things and how do we decide something is right or wrong or hopefully somewhere in between? So we decided to think like our name needs to really, really reflect everything that we cover for the course. Yeah, I, I, we were discussing this the other day, wasn't we? And I do like your new title because it encompasses everything, whereas mm -hmm. people always thought that RE was just religious studies and you just learn the religions. Yeah. Whereas it's, you definitely, thought, it's definitely a truer reflection of what we do. Yeah. You have some really good discussions in there. I've seen that. Um, Mrs Code, mm. we've had a question. What is media? Okay, well, media's around us all the time. We're streaming on YouTube. That's called um, social and participatory media. Um, we're watching films, whether that be on Netflix or at the cinema. We're watching television, whether it's box sets on Netflix or uh, when it's being um, streamed live into our homes on whatever digital channel we might be watching. Um, we also look at um, sort of more traditional forms of media like radio. Um, we look at um, the, the music industry. Uh, we look at the film industry quite broadly, including kind of the way it markets and distributes and exhibits the films. Um, so, yeah, it's a broad, a broad, we even cover um, video games in terms of media. Yeah. yeah. Um, people are asking, when would they find out if they were eligible to be offered the film studies? So um, a communication will be out with you by Friday. Um, it, if, I, if I kind of give you a broad, broad brushstroke of what we're doing, we're looking at the top 5% of performers in exam, under exam conditions in English literature. Um, so their responses to Macbeth, simply because that analytical brain and that ability to write at a high level, um, that's kind of what we're looking for. Um, but it's not just those students. So for example, a number of English teachers have said, while this student didn't perform in the te top 5%, we believe they have the aptitude to do film studies at AS level. So yeah, we're just finalising 
finalising that list and uh, that email will be out by the latest on Friday. Lovely. Um, Miss Bibby, what's been the most interesting discussion you've had in one of your lessons recently with your students? Um, well, actually, with Year 8 at the moment, we have been talking about death penalty. So that's quite uh, brought about quite a few interesting conversations. And then, then we've uh, recently also been talking about euthanasia. And that's been quite interesting for some students because I think when they came in to these conversations, they were like, oh, you know, yes, no, it's all black and white. And they realised, actually, there are all these issues in life that aren't necessarily black and white. There's all this grey area that they need to kind of figure out where they stand and where other people stand and have those kind of difficult conversations. Um media hmm. which are that um oh they're asking can you take media and art i think that will be a question for mr newman to answer absolutely it's to do with the blocks isn't it miss yeah um what films do you watch films in your media studies um so yeah we do watch um kind of extracts from films in order to consolidate their learning and understanding of things like cinematography which is the shot types the shot angles the camera movement um editing terminology so in year nine there's a lot of making sure that they um they understand the terminology by us looking at a wide range of texts um, obviously, in film studies, it, much like literature, uh, the films are the set texts. So we have to learn set texts. Um, both both year, year nine in film and media are fairly similar because it's laying down the foundations of all the language uh, that they need to acquire. Um, so when they're doing, so they're pra there's a practical element to their media yeah. GCSE. Yeah. So um, I'm outside looking in. I have absolutely no idea. Are they then producing their own bit of film? So there are a number of options. At the moment, currently, we're guiding them to play to their strengths. So in the past, when students have been doing the moving image option, that's often proved quite burdensome in terms of the amount of work that has to go into that. That's not saying a lot of hard work doesn't have to go into the print options like making a magazine. But certainly, when we look at those together, we see that the strongest students tend to be doing the print options because of the kind of um, the media technologies that we can access on, on web based design means they can have a really polished piece of work yeah them struggle a little more to do the same level of quality <laughs> work when using moving image um right mrs code in mm. media is there a lot of coursework involved okay so the um media studies gcse is broken into three components component one components one and two are exams okay so component one is based on a set of um set texts that are uh, print based so for example we have film posters um, um magazines adverts um we have broadsheet and tabloid newspapers and they study those set texts um, then the second paper is more to do with moving image. So they have to watch a, an extract from a, a set text um, for the exam and then analyse that, that piece live. Um, and then the third component is the non examinment So that is what they do their um, practical work. That's worth, so it's 40% um, for component one, 30% for component two, and 30% for component three, which is the practical. And then they've, a parent has asked, do we um, annotate the films? Um, so although actually you can annotate films, uh, what we tend to do is we tend to um, watch a sequence and really, uh, first of all, acquire the um, technical language. And then we would analyse the sequence as much as we would analyse, say, for example, the language used by Shakespeare and Romeo and Juliet. We'd look at the film language and um, really explore the film not only in terms of the language but in terms of the context um you know what context it, has it come out of what ideas are suggested uh, kind of you know what are the ideologies you know does it come from a sort of patriarchal ideology or does it come from uh, a kind of alternative um cultural structures um yeah so we have a look at a range of those and also obviously the film um the film industry itself is really important in that as well People are loving you, Mrs. Cove. We've yeah, they are. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, so I'm glad. I'm glad that someone's <laughs> fun is thinking of taking media. So in terms of the, the coursework, coursework is um, the non-examined assessment. And actually, um, students are expected to um, do that under... Um, 
con uh, sort of supervised conditions in school. Obviously, that's been relaxed during sort of um, the, the uh, COVID um, years, but um, they are strictly the NEA is conducted under supervised conditions in school. Miss Bibby, I'll ask you a question. <laughs> so um, I'm quite a quiet student and you're having these discussions in your class. Um, do you encourage the quiet ones to, to join in? Um, or do they tend to get more confident as the course goes on and then, then they're quite happy to voice their opinions and their ideas? I think um, because as we have quite small classes at the GCSE, um, the environment's really nice to foster the quieter ones to get involved and become more confident. There's no pressure at the beginning to have a discussion. They don't have to have a long speech at the beginning, but as they grow in confidence, they take part in more and more discussions. And, it's, and you know, the small classes really help, I think, foster that for each student. So is your course, um, yours is exam right at the end, isn't it? Yes, it's yeah. all exam. It's um, two exam papers an hour and 45 minutes. So paper one is covering our two religions, um, Buddhism and Christianity. So I chose them as contrasting because Buddhism is more philosophical um, and uh, Christianity is a bit more linear with what we learn. And then the other paper, paper two, is all about ethics components, which is covering crime and punishment, euthanasia, abortion, environmental rights, human rights, war and peace, um, capital punishment. So that 50% is very, very broad in terms of the topics that we cover, but it's all exam based right at the end. Lovely. I think I'm going to have to join some more of your lessons to walk <laughs> into the debates. They, they are really, really interesting, aren't they? They are. It's part, I think it's sparked a really interesting year eight because I didn't think we had enough uh, we didn't show enough of what we do at the GCSE, but at the moment we're trying to integrate some of the topics that we do at GCSE and it sparked a real interest. And Mr. Jones and I are having a drop in on Friday where they can speak to some of, that, some of our year nine, current year nine and current year 10 students um, about right. what we teach and what the topics are. So what time, when is that on Friday? So I can Lunch make... time on Friday. Lunch time in Mr. Jones's room? Mr. Jones's room, yes. Yeah. And we we put put it on the Google Classroom, but we'll put it up again so that they know. And just as a reminder, we yep. remind them in class as well. Lovely. Um, do we have any other questions out there? Because I think Mrs. Code needs to answer a few more. <laughs> <laughs> <How is it? laughs> Happy to answer as as many questions. We have had a lot of media. No. So if we just wrap it round that up, so Friday they will get an invite if they are deemed um, that they can access the AS level film. Yeah. Um, everyone, all others can obviously apply for media or art or, sorry, nearly said it, religion, philosophy and ethics. Mm -hmm. Open to everyone. And Friday, open to everyone to come along, pop in, talk to our students. Yeah, got that down there. Lovely. Then we're wrapped up here, Mr. Newman. Lovely. Amazing. Thank you very much. Well, we'll say thank you to Mrs. Code and Ms. Bibby for their time this evening. You can now go and enjoy the rest of your evening. Um, so thank, thank you very much you. to both of you. Bye. Thank you. Um, Bye. Take care. Bye. Um, just a couple of uh, questions there. Ms. Shabba, can you remember, I heard you say there, one to check with, with me. What was, yeah. what was that question again? It was, can they take media and art? Yes, they can. Yes. So as a reminder, the the, uh, the subjects they cannot take together. Um, you've got um, on one side, um, uh, you've got on one side, you've got art, photography, art textiles and 3D design. So those yep. are the four subjects. You can only take one from that group. Also, then a separate group, separate group is PE uh um the uh, sports science scene at and dance okay they can however do say art and dance so i'll say there's two yeah. separate groups there you go yeah, you are, you're doing your little dance you so, you would... um, <laughs> so there's a, they, they can however do uh, uh do uh, the question there about media and art yes they can obviously that'd be a great uh combination potentially for someone who wants to go into certain things to do with the media design uh, um, those sorts of things that could actually be a really nice complementary option. So uh, something to, to perhaps think about there. 
There was also a question earlier um, I noticed that we didn't get time for around, can you do the enterprise BTEC um, and the um, Cambridge National? Um, and unfortunately, you cannot unless you are on the personalised pathway. And remember earlier, I, I said that if you are someone who we think would benefit from the personalised pathway, you will have been contacted separately um, about that. So um, unfortunately for, the, for, for most students, that is a no on uh, uh, the BTEC and uh, Cambridge National as a combination. OK, so that would obviously be a choice you'd have to make. You could, for example, instead do GCSE PE with the enterprise if you wanted to do that. You know, you can think about which uh, option uh, combination you would like to do instead. Um, but unfortunately, not both of them unless you're on that personalised pathway. Uh, Ms Shabot, are there any other general questions you've um, heard you think I've missed? We've got some here. I'm just flicking right the way to the beginning. Um, anything the school are going to be able to do to support pupils in maths, for example? I would say that that would be that's a subject specific and I would recommend you contacting the head of department. Um, I know a lot of departments do some drop-ins and some sessions here and there. So if you are concerned that your your child is, uh, well, if you're concerned that your child needs to support in specific subjects, please contact the head of department directly to ask them what they've got available now. There are a lot of websites out there that you can use. Um, so that would be a subject specific for that one. Yeah, absolutely. And I'd say that for any subject, you know, uh, we, we are always happy to obviously support any students who feel they might need it in any way. So it's always worth kind of uh, um, discussing that with uh, um, uh, teachers or heads department if you feel that's something that might benefit uh, you if you're the student uh, listening to this or if you might if you think that might benefit uh, your child. Um, and we will always do our best to try and support people where um uh where we uh where we can uh there as well um as Ms. Shabot said some subjects do drop-ins and certainly as we get closer to exams we uh, offer uh, intervention groups we offer revision sessions things like that uh, are quite common uh, as part of our um um our um, um, kind of offer for students, especially as I say, they get closer to exams when that time comes around. Just a few key reminders uh, uh, that I would like to end with. First of all, is if you haven't already, um, uh, if you haven't already, uh, uh, please take a look at the um, uh, taster sessions um, uh, timetable that is on the uh, options website. Um, and uh, if there are subjects you think you would like to attend a taste session for, please do go along. I'd really encourage you to do that, um, to get a flavour of what that is, especially um, obviously those are being offered for specifically subjects that students don't currently do uh, in year seven or eight. Um, reminder that we are all here to support you uh, uh, through this process. So please come and speak to uh, myself or uh, Ms. Shabolt uh, if you need any general advice. Former tutors are also a good port of call for that, or subject specific teachers uh, uh, for that um, as well. And a reminder, the deadline for option forms, please, is the 22nd of March, uh, and the Google form for that is also on the options website. We will also send out a reminder a couple of days before that with the link to make uh, uh, sure that everyone has access to that as well. Um, but um, make sure, please, we get that in. Uh, two uh, quick questions uh, just coming in. One around MFL. Um, we, we, we do encourage students uh, to take um, uh, both history, uh, uh, history and geography and a language. Um, the reason we encourage students to, to do that is really so they can be as competitive as they possibly can be. Um, obviously, courses um, at a, a higher and further education as well as in the workplace, becoming more and more competitive. Uh, and obviously our students will be competing with students that have uh, had all different types of education, including those who've been educated abroad, including those who uh, uh, may have had private or selective educations. And we, and, and I personally feel really passionately that actually our students should be able to compete with those students. So that's the reason behind that. Um, um, obviously, um, if, you know, a, a subject really, really isn't for you, 
uh, then you know that is something that we, that you need to consider. Um, and all we can do is offer advice um, around that. Um, remember though, however, every single student does need to pick at least one from that group. So at least one from the history, geography, and MFL group. Um, but obviously that does include history and geography as well as, as I've just mentioned. Um, in a moment, we are now going to welcome uh, Miss Hockey, um, who uh, is going to do our Russell Group uh, presentation. We're actually going to start that slightly earlier than is on our schedule. Um, but um, if um, uh, you are um, uh, invited for this part of the presentation, you should have had a communication from Miss Hockey yesterday evening. Um, so um, everyone else is now uh, uh, very welcome to uh, leave. Uh, the uh, live stream. We thank you very much for joining us this evening. Uh, we hope you found this useful and I want to reiterate this, that there is support available and advice throughout the next few weeks should you need it. So I'm now just going to bring in Miss Hockey uh, to our presentation. Good evening. Hi everyone. Um, and, Good evening Miss uh, Hockey. <laughs> and um, would you like me to share your presentation? Uh, Miss uh, yes, would you please? I think I'm going to have to do that old favourite from the uh, government press conferences of next slide, please, as I don't seem to have any control over uh, my presentation. Yeah, I, yeah. So please do bear with me, anyone who's watching uh, with that. And um, just one question I did notice that has come up, and it's one that generally comes towards me when they start taking their options in year nine, um, is about swapping options over. Um, we always have a window, just so you are aware of students to change their minds. Uh, within that are the same caveats that you've heard about all night, in, uh, including the combinations of option choices um, and what are the prerequisites and requirements. Um, but by the time we get to year nine, that might not always be possible, depending on how the subjects have aligned in their blocks and whether it works with all their other blocks as well. Um, and we also do have some cases where we can make it work but other classes have to change and students are very settled in those other classes and therefore refuse not to, and they just don't want to move. So my um, that always gets sent out at the beginning of year nine, how we go about the options change process. And there's always a period of time to allow students for that because it is a big decision um, and they are taking it now. And sometimes some courses don't quite work out for some students in the first instance. And that's that's to be expected. It wasn't quite what they thought. Um, it's perhaps not exactly as they expected it to be, and therefore we are allowing them that chance to change as well. Perfect. So um, I'm now going to share the uh, Russell Group presentation. Um, and um, to do that, I'm also going to turn off myself and Michelle Bolt's screen. Miss Hockey, as you say, you're going to do the uh, uh, government presentation. I'll be missing this. Uh, the <laughs> next slide, please, and I will uh, uh, help you with that in the background Thank you. as well. So, um, as I say, well, our Russell Group presentation now with uh, Miss Hockey coming up. Okay, so it's really a delight to welcome. I'm hoping there's a large number of you who've been able to attend this. Um, if you weren't on my original email to be sent out, please don't feel offended by it. Um, as with a number of other things, we look at uh, attainment of students and select students by that. In this case, I looked at uh, students' prior attainment. Uh, uh, from the CAT scores that they did and also their most recent exam assessments to sort of identify a number of students where this might be most appropriate for them to listen to. Um, if you could do the next slide for me, please, Mr. Newman. Um, so one of the things that always strikes me is the disparity, as Mr. Newman mentioned as well, between those students who've been to selective schools and those students who've been to comprehensive schools and their plans post-18. Um, I'm a passionate believer in education for all students and ensuring that all students can access the very best of education, uh, no matter their starting points. And therefore, it always surprises me that to find out, I guess this bit isn't a surprise, that 96 percent of privately educated young people end up going to university in comparison to 36 percent of state educated I think it was the big 60% gap that was quite a shock for me. And I think this has really declined over the last number of years, especially with the increase in tuition fees. I am definitely old enough. Um, I had to pay tuition fees, but I paid a very small amount um, compared to what is now. And I can probably understand for some students that that amount is quite daunting. Um, but I do believe, obviously, that there are significant opportunities to go into university. And this is what this presentation is about. 
So that gap between those students who are privately educated compared to those who go to state school, even attending university is vast. And then that is very much mirrored um, with students who go to what might be determined the Russell Group or very highly selective universities. And if you go to a state school, if you go to a private school, 48% of students who go to private school go to one of those highly selective universities in comparison to 18%. Again, you're looking at about half those percentages and that gap is quite ast um, astonishing, I think, in a, in a society as well that is supposed to be narrowing that gap. Um, if you could press the next, uh, the next bit. The thing that um, I think really makes the impact for me and why I believe it's really important to speak to young people and parents about going to these highly selective universities is that those people who do go to those universities tend to earn at least 10% greater than those who do, go to other kinds of universities. So we know that generally there is a gap between university and non-university and then those who go to highly selective and non and the less selective universities uh, there's that 10 percent earning gaps over a lifetime as well so i think that's really important that students are aware of that and see where um they can get to but also what is required because as mr newman sort of mentioned a bit earlier to get into those universities you are competing against people who've been to private school and as much as I, we would like to offer students say exactly the same um, experiences, there are some things that are slightly different in a state school compared to a private school. If I can have the next slide, please, Mr. Newman. So the two biggest and high, most selective state schools you will be uh, at universities, um, um, the, you've got University of Cambridge, University of Oxford. I can see there's some questions coming through and I will keep a note of them and answer them at the end of the presentation. I hope that's OK. Um, University of Cambridge, University of Oxford, they are the two most elite universities in Britain, or very much considered so, and they have a worldwide reputation. And they have a worldwide reputation um, for a very good reason. They're hugely historical um, in terms, they've been around for a very, very long time. Um, and a large number of British politicians and prime ministers have been to those. They educate kings and queens and politicians from all over the world. And some of the leading scientists as well and people in their, in their fields. So they are highly selective. And generally to get into those, you do require three to four A's at A-level with the A-stars and the well-rounded student, which we'll talk about in a minute. However, the Russell Group isn't just limited to those two universities. If I could have the next slide, please, Mr. Newman. All of these other stu all of these other universities um, count as part of the Russell Group. So alongside Oxford and Cambridge, which we normally refer to as Oxbridge, we have all of these. And I noticed someone has said about in the rough area. So round here, the, the closest universities that link to this, obviously you've got Oxford, it's not very far away at all, but a large number of London universities as well. Um, what makes these universities part of this Russell Group? Why are they so well known? So first of all, they generally have worldwide reputations. They're well known across the globe for the standard of education they produce, which means they also get a large number of foreign students who come to uh, uh, study at them as well. They have fantastic facilities. They are centers of research for science, uh, for all arts research as well. So research isn't limited just to sciences. They actually produce two thirds of the world's leading research. Um, so all the research that's published in the world, they produce two thirds of it. Um, they each have their own very specific um, ethos and their own specific history as well. Um, and some are very, very old like Oxford and Cambridge. So Durham would come into that. And then you have some newer universities as well, um, such as the university I went to. I went to the University of Warwick, and it's a much more modern university um, within that. Within these as well, they're very different, as I've just said. So Oxford, Cambridge are what's called collegiate universities. So they have their own individual colleges. And within that, it's like a micro university within itself, I suppose. Um, and then you have your city universities, such as the University of Bristol. So if you were looking for a big city nightlife and all of that, you have those. And then you have, as I mentioned before, the University of Warwick, which is a campus university. So pretty much all your facilities are in one place. So they become like a little town in themselves. They're all very, very unique. 
but as well as the worldwide reputations, um, the centers of research, they also have very, very high levels of graduate employment. And obviously that is really important because you'll have spent a large amount of money going to these universities. There's no denying it. It's £9,000 a year to get to one of these universities. Obviously there are grants and um, loans available that you pay back when you're earning a certain amount. But within that, you eventually do have to pay that back and you need to get a job. So they have very high rates of graduate employment after students attend their universities. If I could have the next slide, please. Um, I think if you'll need to click a couple of times, there should be pictures in all of those gaps. Um, thank you very much. Um, so I like to show people some of the um, sort of famous people that have been around in the recent years who we may or may not realise went to these universities, just to give you a little bit of inspiration. Um, so I think some people that obviously we've been very used to seeing that we can see on the board. So you've got Chris Whitty, or, um, who went to Painbrook College Oxford in his study of physiology. He's got numerous degrees after his name and he went to several of those universities to get where he did. Um, moving along, uh, you've also got Patrick Valance on there as well, who studied medicine at Nottingham. You've got Jonathan Van Tam, who studied medical science and medicine at Nottingham and Jenny Harries, who studied pharmacology at Birmingham. And the reason I mention these are, these are people who really uh, came to the front in the most recent uh, news outlets because of the pandemic and the work that they've done. And obviously they studied a very specific course, they studied medicine and pharmacology and all that goes alongside that. But look at where it's got them and, and how they've um, got to that. But obviously we've got our prime minister as well. He famously studied um, at, at Oxford and classics. And the Chancellor Rishi Sunak, who studied what's a very specific course at Oxford called PPE, Politics, Philosophy and Economics. And it's a course studied by a large number of people who want to go and work in politics. It's a very, 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 very well respected course. Um, and then I've got a couple of other um, people who you may or may not realise went to some of these universities. So we've got Emily Sande, um, who studied neuroscience at the University of Glasgow, Jessica Ennis who studied psychology at Nottingham. She also went on sports scholarship there. So these universities will do sports scholarships and things like that as well. Um, we've got JK Rowling, who studied French and classics at Exeter. Um, and uh, also, I missed him out earlier on, uh, Keir Starmer, who studied obviously law at Leeds and Oxford as well. So we've got some people, and there's a lot more people, a lot of sports people in here as well. Uh, Matthew Pinson fam famously went to one of these universities, the Rower, and some of them will go on there, as I said, on sports scholarships, but also to study the courses as well. If I can have the next slide, please. And um, so how do you get into these universities? Well, as I, you can see on here, you are going to need at least grade fives or higher in English and math. As I said, you are competing against the top students in the country for them. So that's a very minimum requisite. So grade five, that's the equivalent of a top C, low B in old money. Um, so in case, because obviously those numbers are still quite new. And if you've not had children yet go through that grading system, I know how difficult it could be to understand them. Um, if you are going to do medical degrees or any kind of scientific research, you must have studied separate sciences. And this would also go for any university in the country. If you're going to do medicine, if you're going to do science, and in medicine, I do mean things like veterinary science as well, dentistry, anything like that, um, you will need to do separate sciences. They are universities that like the traditional subjects. So they like a humanity and they like a language. There is absolutely no doubt that children at private school study a GCSE in a language. I would be lying if I said they didn't. There might be the odd one or two, and that would be down to a very specific need. But you are competing against them, and a language is considered an academic subject and shows a level of academic rigour, and also shows that you're able to cope with a tough subject, which is what it is. There's no denying that either. Um, and then within that, they want you to have a range and I think this is something that um, is quite difficult, perhaps, for some students, especially when they're quite young, year eight, to understand what we mean by that range. Because if you like art, you might want to do all those arts, and that's fantastic. And you can totally go and do that once you're 16. However, before 16, you want to keep your options open as much as possible. 
So you want to show perhaps to prospective employers, colleges, universities, and even when you're older, that you've got a broad range of knowledge. Now, taking something creative isn't for everyone. And I totally appreciate that. Um, you might be sitting there thinking, well, I really want to go to one of these universities, but I'm not particularly creative. That is fine. But think about something that's perhaps slightly, that's not all written, that's not all essay based, that's not all, you know, computing, statistics, triple science, that you have something else in your locker to demonstrate you as a well-rounded person. And then within that as well comes the extracurricular. And the importance of extracurricular cannot be understated. So when you get the opportunity, and I know extracurricular has been really difficult over the last few years, um, but things like sports teams outside of school, even if you're not particularly sporty and are never going to go and do PE, GCSE or PE at university, having an interest in a sport is really useful. Playing a musical instrument, Duke of Edinburgh, volunteering, all of those different things bring to you a wealth of experience and knowledge and just show what a well-rounded person that you are. Because that, I have to say, is what private schools do. Okay, so they will go and volunteer and they will do Duke of Edinburgh and they will do all of those things. So it's really good for you to get involved. We offer Duke of Edinburgh. So I would highly recommend if you're considering applying to one of these universities or really want to push yourself, go and do Duke of Edinburgh. It's a fantastic opportunity um, that you can really learn about yourself and your resilience and also achieve something that's really highly recognised as well. And then outside of that as well is have some interests. Have some interests that make you perhaps slightly different to the next person. That could be anything from manga books. I know some students have read a lot of manga cartoons to writing your own stories. I've gone very much down the literary route there. Um, historical interest, museum interest, anything. But just have something that you're really interested in that you go out and do. So when someone says, oh, what are your hobbies? You have something to talk about. And... That something is quite difficult to um, to do. And I have to say, I went to a state school myself. I went to um, a comprehensive school. Um, and it's why I'm passionate about going to um, and working in a uh, state school as well. Um, I went to state school. I then was lucky enough to get to Warwick. And then I also went to Oxford as well. And I did find, first of all, when I got there, that um, having to go to formal dinners and make what's called small talk and conversations was not actually something that came particularly naturally to me. It wasn't something I did a lot of before I went to university. Um, so being able to have conversations with people, I think, is really important. So have opinions, watch lots of films, read lots of books, read the news um, and have an opinion about something and get interested in things and find out what excites you so that you you have that to talk about. And I'm sure you're all fascinating people who've all got something. Um, and I really enjoy talking to students who've got an interest in something that I have known nothing about. So I'm always fascinated on a Wednesday evening as I come down, I teach year nine on a Wednesday afternoon. I come downstairs, I'm walking in towards the SLT meeting and I see Mr. Bate has got his, I'm not entirely sure what kind of club it is. I think it's some kind of gaming club with Dungeons and Dragons and World of Warcraft, I think, and those kind of role player games, which I do not understand, I have to say, but I find it absolutely fascinating to watch students and see them so engaged in it. And allowing them to have those interests is just, I think it's fantastic. And that's the kind of thing that makes you stand out. If I could have the next slide, please, Mr. Newman. So if you could just click through and I can talk through it. So these are some random degrees that you might choose to do and then the sort of subjects that you might wish to talk uh, to take at GCSE to help you with it. So if you're thinking of doing architecture, which you might think is all about drawing, and yes it is, but you do also need quite a high level of maths. And if you are going to go and do architecture, we would recommend things like art, we would recommend maths, obviously you all have to do it, but thinking about when you go to do A levels, things like design technology, and then separate science physics as well. Chemical engineering, so physics, biology. I know Miss Saville mentioned earlier on about further maths for those of you who are really keen on mathematics. Um, and then computing or computer science. As I said, for um, dentistry, dentistry is a really interesting one. Things like uh, maths and uh, biology, obviously biology is obviously a standard one there, but maths and chemistry are really important 
for things to do with anything to do with science. If you're thinking of going to study economics, learning things like history, business studies and computing would help you there. Geology and earth sciences, uh, so something like geography and computer science, um, engineering, uh, engineering, by the way, generally tends to be a four year degree quite often with a work placement as well, um, is further mathematics, design technology, computing, history of art. Um, that's what um, Princess Kate studies, I believe, if I remember correctly. So if you want to say history of art, if you're really interested in art and learning about how to how art developed over time and how to appraise pictures, obviously you would want to take art. But within it as well, you need to have a well-rounded understanding of things like English literature, history, religious studies, and languages as well. And the same very much for law. Law is a really interesting one. Obviously, it's highly competitive to get into, I have to say. It's very, very competitive. Um, but they really like subjects. They do like art. They like English for obvious reasons. History is very important. RE, languages, geography, and probably a slight curveball one here for law, drama which is obviously because you have the ability to stand up and talk in front, uh, talk in front of people confidently. Um, so that's what's really interesting. And then politics, if you're interested in politics, perhaps thinking about history, RE, even business studies or enterprises we study. And then finally, for psychology, obviously, we've now got psychology GCSE. Um, but something like obviously you want bio biology, mathematics is important within that and computing and computer science. Um, you don't ever have to have studied psychology GCSE to go on generally and do it at A level. And you sometimes don't need to have studied it at A level to do it for GCSE if a degree, just so that you are aware of that. Um, everything to do with degrees in university is always available on all their websites. So they have a really good, um, very clear show of what's available, what course. And there's some very weird, wonderful, amazing courses out there, as well as your very traditional courses as well. So it's just a little flavour there for you about the Russell Group and the kind of courses and also the extracurricular offer that you could consider whilst you're going through your GCSEs to build, I guess, your portfolio ready for applying for university, which you have to do um, at the start of year 13. So once you finish your GCSEs, it's only one more year before you would start to think about that. Um, so I hope that's been informative for you. Um, I will take any questions that anyone's got. If you wish to pose them in the chat, um, I will answer them now. Going back to the first question, areas in the universities in the area I'd recommend. Obviously, you've got the University of Surrey. I haven't mentioned that this, this evening because obviously it's not part of the Russell Group, but it is very well renowned for what it does, especially in terms of business and in terms of um, um, sports as well. But locally, in terms of Russell Group University, you've got your big London universities. Uh, Southampton obviously isn't that far. Um, and obviously the University of Oxford as well. Lovely. Thank you very much, uh, Mitoki, uh, for that. Um, uh, questions come through in the chat about what does Duke of Edinburgh um, actually entails? This is an extracurricular yeah. uh, activity that we offer at school. Uh, the most well-known part of Duke of Edinburgh is probably the expedition. Um, so you have to uh, go on, a, on an expedition. It, it works on three different levels. There's bronze, silver and gold. So you would start with bronze and then you can work through different levels, although some students might just do bronze and then leave it there or just do bronze and silver and then leave it there. But the expeditions uh, get longer uh, um, uh, as you go through that. Um, where you essentially have to try and be self-sufficient for um, um, for bronze. It's normally uh, um, a day and a night. So you'll do a, a day's expedition, stay overnight, short a bit of expedition the following day, and they get gradually longer. But actually, uh, there are also other parts which perhaps aren't as well known for Duke of Edinburgh around things uh, such as uh, commitment to charity or community work um, and also learning new skills. Um, as well and, and all of that gets recorded and then you get formally assessed as part of that and it is an excellent thing um, as Miss Hockey said and as I said earlier if you want to make yourself stand out against students who've had a range of different educations uh, internationally private selective state you know there's loads of different ways people are educated and that uh, uh, that's a really good way of you start starting to make yourself stand out 
um, and show yourself as a well-rounded individual. It shows real resilience to do that. I've supported many DOV expeditions in my time, uh, and it's it, it's tough, you know, and, and it shows a real sense of, of resilience, determination, teamwork, those really important skills that employers and, and universities look for. Um, Ms. Hockey, there's a question there about the geology geography one. Just ask yeah. you to clarify something. So uh, for geology, um, they have recommended things like, as obviously geography and earth sciences, then it would be something like computing. And that's generally down to, I believe, sort of things like the computer modelling eventually that they go on and use. I have to say, I'm not completely familiar with geology and sciences as a degree. Um, it wasn't my subject specialist, but that's something that is. But again, my my recommendations, if you are, if there's a course that's, you know, I guess, piqued your interest this evening, you know, go on to a university website, look at what they ask for A-level. Is it offered at GCSE? And then if it is, then that's something that you might be interested in to take. And then obviously always keeping your options open that broad balanced in case you change your mind because people do change their mind um from when they're you know 12 13 and going up to when they're you know when they're 18 19 or even older i didn't decide to become a teacher so i finished university uh so you know you, it's about having that broad balanced opportunity i think available is really important just a couple more uh, mm -hmm. questions coming through. So do you need a language to uh, get into a Russell Group uh, university? So it's a really tricky one. There's one university that does specify you should have a language at UCL. Um, they actually make that a prerequisite um, of their admissions. So they do say that. The others are preferred. Obviously, unless you're taking a language as the degree, then you would definitely need that um, as your course. Um, my experience of it is it does help quite significantly and partly as you are competing and i'd like to say that everybody just gets in there on their own merit well no they don't they get tens of thousands of applications every year and they're looking for students that fulfill the criteria that they want these are academic universities therefore they are looking for a certain kind of student and they will look at the kinds of gcse's um, and qualifications they've taken and they will make that decision on that and whilst we don't make it compulsory for students to take a language because it isn't right for every student in our school we're fully aware of that that it's not appropriate for it because we are a fully inclusive comprehensive school however whilst we are fully inclusive we also have students who should be going to Oxbridge and they are going to compete for a place at Oxbridge against someone who's been to Eton and you can guarantee at Eton they've done at least one language. And I think that's the kind of, that's, that's the mindset of it. It's, it's that added skill. It also shows a level of cultural awareness. And at the moment, the, the UK is really languishing in terms of um, language skill. We've got a real lack of language ability and it is actually having an impact on our, econ in our economy in terms of our ability to trade. And that came out from a report recently done by the CBI um that's available so it's it is something that does need addressing as and obviously recommending that students take that language and even if they then don't use that language in what in their do what it shows to an employer a university person anything um is that they can then learn a language so if they what if they take french but they have to go and then work in Brazil and or work with a company in Brazil, one of the big BRIC countries, that's Portuguese. They will look at some of well, you've got some language ability. We might we'll put you through that because you can do it. So it allows that as well. And it does allow you to get onto some courses that perhaps you wouldn't otherwise. And one of my one of my stories, as there's a couple of stories I've got, I am a language teacher, so I'm slightly biased about it. I fully admit that. But um um, I used to teach A-level in my previous school um, and I taught both French and German to A-level. I had some students who were going to university and one student wanted to study medicine. So it was so competitive to get into medicine. Like even this student who got, um, she got all A's at GCSE, was targeted and predicted four A's, she was fluent in French, uh, predicted four A's at A-level, played violin to grade eight, did work experience, couldn't get a place. She, for some reason they didn't offer her a place so she was able to she actually went and studied in France because she had a language so she did her degree in France um, and then another student who wanted to study neuroscience couldn't get they only have four places so four places at UCL to do neuroscience for the whole country 
Um, she couldn't get in, but they offered a slightly random course of neuroscience with French. So she did that instead. So sometimes it will allow you that, that's what I'm talking about in terms of opportunity. It allows you that opportunity that perhaps you wouldn't have otherwise. And obviously the ability to communicate wide. So it, as I say, it's not hard and fast apart from UCL, they still have that as a criteria, um, but the others do like them very much. So especially Oxbridge, yeah. Perfect, thank you. Got a question about uh, creative subjects recommended to get into Ross Group Universities. Again, we spoke about the broads, balanced yeah. education. Um, is, universities employers uh, always want to see a, a well-rounded individual, but also as Ms. Hockey said, some, some surprising kind of ones as well around uh, things like law, you know, drama's great for, for that, anything that involves presenting, yeah. you know, and, and things like that, you know, you know, drama's great for this, there's this stuff there as, as well to kind of consider. I think, I think coming in on that one, I think one of my recommendations there might be to consider looking at maybe geography, history, language, and then a fourth creative subject, uh, which is why we offer four options at GCSE, not three, some schools do three, we offer four. Um, maybe considering that that is a that's a highly academic curriculum. Um, it is a very common curriculum. I do see a large number of able students do history, geography, MFL, and then they'll do something like art, or they'll do music, or they'll do drama, and then there's a range of students as well within that who will do history, geography, MFL, and AS film. Doing the AS film shows you've got an academic ability that's above your year group. So that's why we offer that as well. So that's one of our offers for our more able students to allow them to compete as well. At, uh, so it shows that you've done something different to the rest of your peers as well. Um, I know there's a question about medicine. Medicine, yeah, I would go history or geography. Again, you could do the fully academic route like I've just mentioned, history, geography, and def I would recommend an MFL as well. Uh, a lot of medical research is done randomly in Germany actually. I had a friend who did uh, cancer research in uh, as their PhD and they did it out in Germany. They did it in Nottingham and then they moved out to Germany and lived and studied out there to do their final PhD as part of it. Um, but within that as well, I would still recommend something creative. Again, because of the highly competitive nature of medicine. So you would want that broad balanced curriculum. Again, that's where your AS film would come in, music, drama, dance, um, arts, one of the arts definitely perfect thank you very much um so um thank you very much to uh to miss hockey for that and uh, thank you uh um to everyone who's joined us this, this evening special thanks to miss shabbat who's been here obviously with me all evening uh helping uh, host <laughs> this evening's event uh, and most importantly thank you to all of you um as well for uh, uh tuning in i guess um <laughs> from home uh, and listening to us. We hope it's been useful. I reiterate what I've said several times. Um, there is plenty of support available over the coming weeks. If you need any additional support and advice, please come and speak to myself and Ms. Shabbold. Uh, please speak to individual subject teachers about their subjects um, or speak to former tutors if you just want someone to kind of chat to, who someone who knows you well um, and, and sort of, you know, someone, someone to, to, to chat through your options with please do use the, those uh, opportunities to get some advice. But we hope you found uh, this evening um, helpful. We, will get, we are going to end the evening uh, now and hope that you um, enjoy the rest of your evenings uh, at home with your families. Okay, take care. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>